Okay, I've got uh, 12.58, 11.58, my time here in Saskatchewan. So I think um, we'll, get, uh, we'll get started here. So a, a couple of notes um, for folks. Um, so for, to our colleagues in the provinces and territories, um, again, you know, today is more of a plenary session, um, bringing in our international partners, the IJC and others to give you a flavor of kind of what's going on. And then as we proceed towards the next two days here, you'll find that there's more and more sort of details being discussed and there'll be a separate um, ECCC and province territory workshop sort of format a breakout on the third day where some specifics um, about the system and your interests and, and whatever can be can be discussed. So um, hopefully you'll find this informative and uh, it'll it'll lead some, to some interesting discussions over the next couple of days. Um, as, as far as I know, we're going to be uh, um, handing these uh, presentations out on the GWF website. Um, and so uh, they'll be available and so if people have any issues with that, you know, just let us know. We don't have to put yours up there if there's something you don't want up there. But for now, um, that's the plan. So uh, just just email them, uh, Ivan or myself, and uh, we'll, we'll sort that out. Um, and we were trying to video this, and we should have told you that from the beginning, um, but we forgot. And I'm not actually sure if it's working or not because Teams doesn't have a video. Uh, recording capabilities so we're sort of doing it off the side so um, I'm not sure that's working maybe Pravin if you're on you can let us know okay so so again if we are recording it uh, we will uh, send out an email letting you know that it was successful we're not sure if it will be um, and if you don't want your section of the recording uh, out there, that's fine. Um, we're okay with that. We'll just have to edit it, which is easy to do. So we'll figure that out over the next two days. So just presume that uh, that this is being recorded and if you're comfortable with it, uh, that's fine. Oh, and Pravin just said in the notes, we are recording. So, so there you go. So yeah, if you have any issues with any of that, please just let Evan and I know we're not here to, to uh, to dictate anything, we just uh, we just think this, the students and the provinces and territories would benefit from these presentations, so that's why we'd like to put it up on the GWF website. And we, we'll do a final report as well, and that'll be a bilingual uh, report on the sort of outcomes of the meeting. Okay, so with that, um, we'll go to the um, uh, back to the agenda here. So the next talk is is from Trey Flowers uh, from NOAA. Uh, talking about sort of where they're at with their current uh, current operations um, uh, within the Office of Water Prediction. So, Trey, the floor is yours. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I want to do a quick uh, sound check and that you can see my presentation. And uh, affirmative on both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I want to follow up a little bit on the, the discussion that um, Tom Graziano started this morning about the, the, the national water model. Um, so th this presentation will focus more on our, on our development trajectory for the, for the national water model and won't be as much about the, the, the ins and outs of the, the model system. So as Tom said earlier this morning, the national water model is really our enterprise um, water forecasting solution that we are currently developing and operating. It's the first of its kind water prediction uh, model running on uh, NOAA's supercomputing systems. And the, the power of the national water model is that it provides information where none was previously available. The two figures over on the right, the, the upper figure, that is where we currently, those are point locations across the United States where we currently um, provide a, a river forecast, about 3,400 of, of those locations. Um, that, that represents about 110,000 river miles uh, across, the, across the continental U.S. Uh, the National Water Model, which is shown in the, in, in the bottom figure, um, that it really it, it expands the, the, the network at which we provide a forecast from 110,000 river miles out to about 3.4 million. So it's quite a, an increase in, in fidelity. It provides information where no information was, was previously available. 
and we are um, what we're we're in the the third iteration of the model, the third operational update of the model. We we originally released it into operational um, in, into our operational supercomputing system in August of 2016. Um, since then, we have uh, updated it in 2017, 2018, 2019 with version 2.0. That is the the current version that is that is running on our in, in operations, and we are on the cusp within the next three weeks of releasing the next version of the National Water Model. That'll be version 2.1, that is due on on March 9th. We are also in the in, in development of version 3.0, which will be released in January of 2023. And the, the focus of today's discussion will be talking about the improvements that we've made in version 2.1 and um, what's coming as we look towards version 3.0 in 2023. So starting with, with our, our forcings, we've made some fairly significant forcing improvements um, comparing version 2.0 to version 2.1. One of those is in, in version 2.0, we, we initially deployed the model in, for the Hawaiian Islands. Um, the, the forcing, our preferred forcing, was not available at that time, so we had to use the, the, the NOM nest. Um, with this version of the model, we are upgrading to MRMS precipitations um, uh, forcing for the Hawaiian Islands, and that has made a fairly significant difference in the, in, in the model skill. We've also um, been been using um, MRMS version 12 um, blended radar QPE over the CONUS for our real-time operations. It's um, helped fairly considerably in, in terms of the, the, the quality of the, the coverage for our, our QPE products. We're also transitioning to from um, an NLDAS2 forcing for calibration and for generation of our retrospective run to a product that we have developed here in NOAA's Office of Water Prediction called the Analysis of Record for Calibration, or the AORC. This is a climatology going back to 1979 that gives us forcing information at the same um, spatial and temporal fidelity as we, as we operate the National Water Model. Um, a one kilometer grid spacing and a one hour time step. So some of the other significant improvements that we have made in water model version 2.0 is that we, um, we, we've noticed quite a, a, a degradation in model skill when we go downstream of um, controlled structures such as reservoirs or dams. We have been working to, to improve this by um, better assimilating reservoir data into into the national water model. We've we've done this using three different techniques. One is where we have gauge information from the U.S. Geological Survey um, immediately downstream of a reservoir within a kilometer, and no tributaries coming in. We are taking that that piece of gauge data and we are um, persisting that. We, we find that the, the best indicator of the release from a reservoir tomorrow is the reservoir or, or the release from a reservoir today. And so we are persisting the observation in our short and medium range forecast out to, out to 10 days. Um, we're doing the same thing with um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers with their, with their reservoir data set that recently came online. Um, and, and finally, we are taking the forecast from our river forecast centers for um, where, where it is available and directly substituting that in for the, for the national water model. Overall, we have um, a little over 500 sites where we are improving our reservoir forecast in the short range um, forecast cycle and about 450 sites where we're improving it in the medium range cycle. So quite an exciting um, uh, update there, a, a first step in a very long, um, very long process to to improve the the forecast downstream of regulated structures. The other major enhancements that, that is coming next month is we have continued to expand the domain. 
um, version uh, 2.0 of the model released in 2019. This was the first time that we expanded beyond the borders of the continental United States. In version 2.1, we are carrying that work on. We are um, deploying the National Water Model in the Great Lakes Drainage Basin, as well as in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So some of the, the, the work that we, or the, the improvements that we're seeing through that domain expansion, this is um, the initial implementation in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. This is for Hurricane Isaias, um, and we were able to show not clairvoyant forecast, of course, but we were able to show fairly good um, response in for, for minor and, and moderate floods as a result of Hurricane Isaias. So the, the original results or the initial results on this are, are quite encouraging. And we will continue to upgrade the, the, the model performance in, the, in, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands in, in subsequent versions. We also um, have realized some performance improvements um, due to res uh, in the reservoir outflow through the three methods that I that, that I discussed earlier. So, the figures on the left these are um, uh, two hydrographs comparing water model version 2.1 in the red dash line with water model version 2.0 in the blue dash line, um, along with observations out of a reservoir on the Housatonic River in Massachusetts in the upper and on um, the Red Lake River in Minnesota on the, on, on the bottom. So the, the old technique that we were using for um, modeling these reservoirs in the National Water Model did not perform very well in either of these situations. And we saw some, again, while not clairvoyant, we saw some significant improvement with the, with the rather for, reservoir forecast in, in version 2.1. So um, a, a good first step, but we're, we're not all the way there yet. So overall in version 2.1, we saw for, the, these are for prediction of major floods in the continental U.S. over on the left and on Hawaii over on the right. So in the, in the analysis period where we, where we did the um, the scientific uh, validation of the national water model. Over the continental U.S., we had 43% fewer false alarms. We detected the same number of, event, of events, and we increased our, our threat scores by about 50%. So significant improvement over where we were in version, version 2.0. In the Hawaii domains, um, we, we decreased our number of false alarms from 23 to zero. So we had a 100% decrease in the, in the number of false alarms for major, major floods. Um, so quite, quite, a, quite an improvement version over version. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I would like to talk about what is coming in, the, in, in version 3.0. So, the, the improved reservoirs, the extension into Great Lakes, um, extension into Puerto Rico, along with several other enhancements. That model should be released into operations next month. We are currently wrapping up our, our stability test, which is the, the final step in the, in the process towards getting the, the model deployed into the, the weather and climate operational supercomputing system. So this, um, the, the version that we're going to talk about now, this is the version of the model that will be released in 2023. And um, there, we, we have quite a development footprint with this, with this particular model. I'm not going to go into everything, but I am going to highlight three of our, of our major efforts that are underway. The, the first is um, we're, we're continuing with the domain expansion that we started with in version 2.0 of the model and continued in version 2.1. So we will be expanding the domain into um, the, the Cook Inlet and Copper River Basins in, in Alaska. Um, although we're not going to be able to get full coverage of the, of the state just yet, that'll be a multi-year process that will follow on the work that we're doing now. 
Um, we're capturing about 70% of Alaska's population with um, deploying into into this area, which is a, a small area for the state, but larger than some of the states in the in the U.S. So, um, some of the work that we're doing is to improve our our cold weather processes, including coupling the National Water Model with the Crocus um, Glacier Model, and um, that work is is showing some significant progress so far. So here are some preliminary results. Uh, this uh, these are uncalibrated model results for for the area. In the the upper upper figure, this is um, our, our baseline results looking at a looking at a point where the um, the the model um, results are in the orange color, and the observed results are in the black color. While not clairvoyant, this is um, something that, that we're, we're quite proud of for the initial baseline implementation. There's work to do to improve this, but over a, a multi-year period here, we were able to show um, that, that we were fairly well on the, the, the timing of the peak events. We're a little far off on the, on, on the magnitude of the events. The figure down below, this is um, the, the results of coupling the model with the Crocus Glacier model. So the, um, the, the model results, the baseline performance is in orange. The um, model coupled with the Cro Crocus uh, model is in the, the, the blue, and the observed is in the, in the black line. So very, very encouraging at, at this particular point. We, um, uh, Alaska is the, the final frontier for us in terms of water model deployment, and we're, we're quite encouraged by the, the results that we're seeing so far. So switching gears a little bit, we are also looking at deploying a full summit to sea hydraulic routing capability. So we are um, building a, a full continental scale um, hydraulic routing solution within the National Water Model. Our current framework, um, we, we're completely replacing the current routing framework in the National Water Model with a new framework that, um, that, that allows us to, to execute hydraulic routing calculations. And preliminary results show that um, we're able to run on the scale of the continental U.S. in about four minutes, which is um, uh, along the lines of what it takes now to do the routing in our in our short range um, execution, so we believe that the that the the full hydraulic routing is indeed going to um, be possible even in the the short range configuration of the national water model, and should vastly improve the the, the performance. So. Um, this is work that we're, we're working to um, continue to speed that up, continue to um, uh, find ways to stabilize the calculation. But we're, we're very confident at this point we're going to have success. Um, so far, the, uh, the, this is a, a test basin that, that we have in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we've created the, a method that um, that does completely re reproduce the existing routing in, in the national water model. And we're able to produce um, a, a, a forecast of 24 hours in, in just eight seconds in this basin. So we're, we're again, fairly confident that, um, that, that we're going to be able to produce that continental scale solution. OK. Um, Finally, the, the other big component of the National Water Model is the, the, the total water. This is something that, that Dr. Graziano, um, that, that he, he highlighted in, in some of his opening remarks this morning. About a third of the U.S. population lives in an area where they're affected by um, saltwater processes or processes, tides, um, surges those types of, of effects that come from fairly large water bodies, as well as um, uh, precip uh, hydrology, rainfall, um, flooding that, that is due to um, um, precipitation. So 
one of the challenges that we have is our current modeling capabilities do not allow us to resolve the complex interactions between inland flooding and, and coastal flooding surges and tides. So we have been, um, with, with the new public law that has passed in the United States, the Office of Water Prediction has been tasked with um, creating this total water forecasting approach. So we've been doing that through three different methodologies, so a community of practice that has been going for almost three years now, um, some work that we're doing on creating a, a hindcast coupling system, and work that, that I'll talk about here, which is um, creating the, the total water forecast system. So we did an extensive analysis of alternatives for a, a modeling technique that would allow us to create a total water forecast. Um, we ended up settling on a, a model technique developed out of the Virginia Institute for um, Marine Sciences called SCISM. We were able to um, uh, couple the national water model to ADSERC f-stops as well as um, p-surge and do this in a computationally efficient and, and scalable manner. So we are currently working on deploying this along the eastern Gulf Coast. The Pacific Coast are Oconus domains of Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Hawaii, and, and Alaska. So preliminary results, this is for Hurricane um, Sandy or Superstorm Sandy in 2012. And the, the results showing the, the, the total water from um, the, the combined effects of the, the hurricane as well as the, the, the inland precipitation using F-stops in the red um, and P-surge, which is a probabilistic um, 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 surge uh, forcing is, is over in the right. The 10% exceedance, 20%, and 50% exceedances are all modeled here. So very, very encouraging work. We are in the, in the midst of um, deploying this at the, at the full continental and, and Oconus scales. So I'm going to wrap up my, my portion of this before I hand it off to my colleague. Um, you know, the, the water model is, is, is in its infancy um, with respect to the, the other uh, models that are in the, the production suite at the, the National Weather Service. We um, have been rapidly building on, on that foundation. Um, we, we anticipate having our new version in um, available on March 9th, and we anticipate having version 3.0 with a, um, a further domain expansion, a um, full inland hydraulic routing capability, and a full coastal coupling total water forecast capability in early 2023. And my colleague and our senior scientist at the Office of Water Prediction, um, Dr. Fred Ogden, will talk about the the, the development that we're doing for the, the next-gen national water model. And with that, I will pause for any questions. Great. Thanks for that. So any uh, any, any questions uh, at the moment now for, for Trey, and then we'll may segue into Fred's talk. So. OK, I see one. It's not showing up on my top of my screen, but so whoever has the one question, can you can just uh, ask it right away, please. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I really like to see the assessment, like model assessment in terms of performance, in terms of false alarms and false negatives. Um, as a forecaster, that's really what really matters to me. I didn't see any assessment of timing. I was wondering if you did that and how did you determine or gather um, thresholds for false alarms and was that done on a national scale? So it was done on a national scale and the, the, the science evaluation for the, for the water model, there's a little too much detail to go into in, in this forum, but that is available to, to anyone who wants it. So, um, as far as I know, I can't recall us doing any work on the on the timing. The water model right now is a little bit flashy. It does predict the um, timing a little bit early and um, tends to drain out a little too quickly. So I don't think in the science evaluation that we did here, we did look at that. 
Um, a separate topic that, that we have that we're not going to cover today is um, we have been doing an event-based analysis of the of the different versions of the model. That work is also led by by um, Dr. Ogden, and we we do have some some work on that. If you're if you're interested, you can contact me offline, and we're more than happy to share that. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you for the question. Great. Thanks for the question, Jennifer. Yeah, appreciate it. So so we'll go right into the next uh, speaker then. Thanks, Trey, very much. And Dr. Fred Ogden, I guess, is the next speaker. And sounds like there was a nice uh, segue into his uh, his presentation. So the floor is yours, Fred. Thanks a lot, Alan. Um, Trey, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. OK, just to verify, you can hear me all right? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. So I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to present this to you today. It's a short presentation on where we're headed with what we're calling the next generation national water model. And as this figure shows, it kind of represents the intersection of computer science, geoscience, data standards, and hydrologic science. And that hydrologic science uh, part of the figure goes into some detail about how there are a wide variety of different model formulations that have different levels of appropriateness in, in different situations. And that uh, uh, there, we can't rule anything out at this point as a, in, in terms of what approach we might want to use. If you look at that uh, down in the lower right hand corner, there's um, a machine learning or AI approach that that would be probably undoubtedly useful in certain situations and then the rest of the models all have their places where the literature say that they're they're appropriate uh, let's go to the next slide please so we the current national water model was audited by a group within the u.s government general services administration and, and they found that it's computationally fast, it's deployed in a robust way, and that it, it's, it's uh, numerically stable and reliable. Uh, those, are, those are all positives. Uh, it's monolithic in that it assigns the same formulation everywhere. Uh, it uses a large number of parameters, therefore, and it emphasizes or emphasizes or de-emphasizes parameter processes by parameter value selection, which makes it can fool parameter estimation routines when you when you force parameters to to nullify processes. Uh, the code is structurally difficult to modify and in, in their assessment it, it's in need of rewriting because it's it's been around for a while with a, a large number of people working on it. Let's go to the next slide. What we would like is a model that has high performance uh, within the limits of predictability. And the hydrologic literature suggests that there is no one model to rule them all. Uh, specific model formulations designed with appropriate assumptions often outperform general models. That's the addressing the uniqueness of hydrology or the uniqueness of place. Models using fewer parameters often outperform more general and complex models. That's the, the parsimony argument. And, and in reality, predictability, which all this is, is dependent on, is a multi-dimensional state space. Next, please. So if we think about hydrologic predictability, this is a, a figure I presented at, at the AGU fall meeting this year, and it, I don't really have any hard data to back it up. It's based on my experience over my career. Uh, if you look at that picture in the upper left-hand side, uh, that's a parking lot. Uh, we can make predictions on impervious surfaces or on nearly impervious surfaces quite well. Those are land surface dominated situations. We can look and see what's there. It has a high predictability and a relatively small number of parameters. Now this plot shows a parameter a number required for a model based on the runoff generation process, which is the x-axis. And the, what, over at the left, that land surface dominated situation is what most people would call infiltration excess runoff. If we go and look at the right, that's a photograph I took in a forest in Connecticut when I used to live there. Uh, it's a groundwater dominated system. You, you will never see surface runoff 
unless the groundwater table is at the land surface because the post-glacial history really did flush all, almost all of the fine uh, clays and most of the silts out of the soil, leaving behind sand size or larger particles. Uh, it, and that's typical of a humid climate with coarse soils and shallow bedrock. And I'll call that the, the groundwater dominated system. And a, and a topographic wetness index model like top model uh, can really perform well. Uh, it has a small number of parameters again. It's very sensitive to the water balance, whereas the land surface dominated or infiltration access mechanism is very sensitive to the rainfall rate. Uh, the groundwater dominated system, it really depends on how much water has fallen recently compared to the storage in the system. And then when we look in the middle uh, where the soil and the stratigraphy of the soil is important, then lots of things become important that, that we can neglect in the other two, what I would call end members. Layering, seasonality, macropores, heterogeneity, behavior thresholds, anthropogenic, effects, transient phenomena like freeze thaw, uh, uh, even tillage practices, things like that. So the parameter space becomes really large when you seek to try to develop some kind of a phenomenological model that describes that. And the predictability consequently drops down. And it can at once be sensitive to both the water balance and the rain rate in that domain. So it's, it's, it's really complex. Next slide, please. So in this center space, we lack a comprehensive theory of runoff generation. And uh, that is a place where hydrology has been struggling for the past 50 years or more, uh, as, as different theories have been tested and found to have limited applicability or, or uh, depend on some unique properties of a particular catchment or place. Uh, next slide. And this is one of my favorite photographs that illustrates this. This is a photograph taken down a fence line in April in Iowa uh, after a thunderstorm. And you can see this enormous difference in the behavior of the system based on the structure of the soil. And the difference, the left-hand side is traditional tillage practice. The right-hand side is, is uh, low intensity tillage or uh, you know a lot of a lot more use of agrochemicals to control pests and weeds but you can see that the, the behavior of those two is very different despite the fact that the landscape positions are identical the soils are identical everything is basically identical about those two hill slopes uh, except for the way that the, the farmers uh, till the, the ground so that's the the nature of the challenge that we're up against uh, next slide and what we'd like to do is have a model that can allow us to test different uh, hypotheses about the behavior of different systems. <coughs> We're developing, as, you know, as Martin alluded to earlier, uh, you know, a model agnostic infrastructure, cyber infrastructure, I would say. Uh, we want it to be flexible so as models and data sources evolve, so can the, uh, in the framework. Uh, it will enhance model interoperability when you focus on the infrastructure. Uh, we want it to be extensible to enable multi-objective modeling. Uh, it will provide scientific evaluations uh, to give us evidence as to what appropriate, which uh, formulations might best be applied for making forecasts in different regions. We want it to be locally customizable and what we're developing is uh, with in Trey's division is the notion of model as a service capability. Uh, this infrastructure will allow ensembles of hydrologic models or uh, backup runs. You could you could run a computationally expensive model, and if it doesn't produce a, a, a prediction in the allotted time because of some stability problem, time step limitation, et cetera, you could have a simpler model running as a backup that would still provide uh, the needed information, albeit with lower uh, skill, probably. Uh, we're developing this for the engagement with uh, other federal agencies that have water prediction in their mission and the academic research communities. And ultimately, it will enable rapid advances in predictive skill. At least that's a hypothesis that we have. 
Uh, and finally, this is a Pathfinder activity for the IHTM, or Integrated Hydro Terrestrial Modeling, Earth System Predicting Capability. Hydrologic prediction and Earth system modeling are not exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, the, the literature is full of examples where hydro, getting the right, re, right prediction for the right reasons in hydrology is a very challenging thing. And it, it, the, that level of detail is, may not be uh, exactly relevant for Earth system modeling. Next slide, please. So to wrap uh, up this presentation on NextGen, and it is very brief, but uh, we, we are using an open source source code development paradigm. Uh, we're using standard geospatial data models and libraries. There were quite a few presentations on this at, at the AGU meeting, and I'd be happy to share information with folks who have questions. Uh, we're, we're extending the community service dynamics modeling system basic model interface to work in an HPC environment, which, which it originally was not envisioned to do. Uh, we are also developing a componentized model library, which will, which will allow task-based modeling, which is uh, uh, something that uh, will ultimately allow what I would call meta-modeling where if, you, if your library has got a sufficient number of processes, you can start mixing and matching processes to either duplicate existing model formulations or test new formulations. Um, and ultimately, we want this to meet agency needs to promote science and interoperability. And interoperability is a big issue. A lot of agencies are struggling with that. They've got legacy codes that either don't work together or they haven't been parallelized or they're perhaps not even parallelizable. Uh, this framework that we are talking with our partners about developing will uh, break some of those barriers, we believe. And the, the, the uh, logos there show the federal partners that we've been working with so far and uh, our partners at Quasi and NCAR as well. So with that, I will uh, wrap it up. And I don't know if there's time for questions, but I'd be happy to take any. Great. Thanks so much, Fred. I appreciate that. So if there's any questions, I love your diagram, by the way. That was wonderful. Thanks. Any questions for Fred? OK, so um, was there a question? Sorry, I missed it. Was there one? No. Okay, thanks again, Fred. That, that's that's really great. And, and you know, the interesting thing I, I think on the Canadian side is we were looking at um, uh, we're looking at a community practice as well. So a lot of similarities between the U.S. and Canada on how this all materializes. And as Martin mentioned, some community modeling efforts as well. So um, we'll go to the next speaker uh, right away here. So that's uh, that's John, I believe, or. I don't know, Kevin, I see you on the screen. I'm not sure why, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's you. I recognize you. OK, so there's John. So uh, so John's going to give folks a little bit of an overview of what uh, GWF is doing with respect to the next gen modeling. And uh, John, uh, the floor is yours. OK, great. Um, I'd like to share the screen and I've not seen a button for that. Here we are. OK, got it. Yeah, we can see it now, John. Great, thank you. Okay, good. Looking all right. Great, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so good to talk to everyone again today. And I want to talk about the next generation model development uh, that Global Water Futures has been uh, working on. And um, and this is also uh, with some collaboration from Environment Canada scientists such as uh, Vincent Vionnet that it has been quite substantial. The um, But first, I'm going to step forward and, and talk about um, how we couch modeling within the program. Uh, Global Water Futures has a large core modeling program and Martin Clark uh, spoke about that. There are also uh, dozens of projects which have modeling in them to some degree and uh, sensing and observations as well as a uh, core computer science team led by uh, Kevin Schneider 
that's helping us with the some of the computational aspects and a data team uh, which is uh, also contributing to this. We have, have a very active knowledge mobilization group as well and uh, the uh, the point of Global Water Futures as a transdisciplinary uh, program is to integrate the uh, observations and the predictions with knowledge mobilization. So bring the information out to our users and stakeholders in uh, some useful way. And uh, so that's uh, and then within all that, as we drill down more into the modeling, um, it's a multi modeling strategy and uh, Martin spoke about this uh, in great detail, but uh, sort of the, the bird's eye view of it is that we we've had three models in Canada uh, developed that we've uh, looked at and put a lot of effort in to uh, uh, provide to the community in different schemes. Uh, the cold regions hydrological model is a flexible object oriented process model that's more suitable for smaller scales. And uh, so that that one's being utilized by uh, some of the groups in the mountains or out in the prairies or for agricultural fields, things like that. Lots of flexibility and uh, lots of physics and water quality already fully added to it uh, and is linked to economic models, all kinds of things. Uh, then at a much larger scale is the uh, mesh model. Um, which is a coupled land surface scheme, taking the class land surface scheme, coupling it with uh, hydrology um, and then applying it on uh, large river basins. So this is the sort of model suitable for the Great Lakes Basin or for the Columbia or the Saskatchewan River Basin, Mackenzie River Basin, areas like that. It has the cold regions components built into it, as does CRIM. It has water management built into it. It has feedback between atmospheric and groundwater models uh, looped into the whole uh, the whole aspect. And we uh, we tend to run it in the standalone uh, version. Um, and then what I'll be talking about today is a very new development, a Canadian hydrological model, we call it. It's multi-scale, multi-physics, variable complexity, has very efficient uh, representations and discretization of the basin through triangulated irregular networks and uh, allows us to assess structural uncertainty in the model and uh, conduct modeling experiments to find the right model configuration in the right way. So um, all these are really systems of models frameworks for models. Um, there's flexibility in mesh, flexibility in CHM, flexibility in CRIM, and that's been a uh, key to what we're doing. And now, now with uh, Martin in Canada, we're looking, bringing in aspects of SUMA and others uh, to this. And then of course, with our collaborations with uh, Environment Canada uh, and uh, Vincent Fortin's group, then there's opportunities to work and bring some of this into the SVS2 uh, scheme as well. So the uh, Global Water Futures Next Generation Hydrological Modeling Project is uh, is really about uh, developing flexible spatial and process representation configurations using modern coupling methods and a high degree of parallelism to permit full utilization of high performance computing capabilities. We want to be able to model vast areas, continental domains very quickly um, with high resolution and with high model fidelity and we uh, don't want to throw the physics out uh, in order to do that. So we want a scalable system. Um, it has to be something that we can take from agricultural fields, ponds, forest stands, mountain slopes up to continental river basins to continents themselves. Um, and we want to see multiple representations of hydrological processes in this from the atmospheric boundary layer down to the bedrock and everything in between. Uh, we strive to be physically based. Uh, we permit horizontal interactions amongst the tins and uh, because we, it needs to work in Canada and uh, then we need the cold regions processes involving snow and ice as well as all the rainfall runoff hydrology which is normally needed in a hydrological modeling system. So uh, CHM, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, tin representations of a river system in the in the uh, western mountains in Canada. Um, it, uh, as I mentioned, uses the unstructured triangular mesh, which uh, means that you have small triangles where you have lots of things going on, lots of complexity in topography and vegetation, and larger tins where things are less complex. Uh, the, the tins are essentially control volumes of which we uh, calculate the hydrological processes, uh, the uh, response, the runoff response and the state variables uh, within the system. We wanted a flexible structure so we could test multiple hypotheses and assess modeling uncertainty in the system. 
and we want to incorporate existing code from uh, the three models I uh, showed you, as well as uh, uh, SUMA and others. And um, and it's important that it have uh, be able to couple with numeric weather prediction models, such as the GEM model from Environment Canada, in a way to downscale the meteorological fields uh, down to the scale of, of uh, tens of meters in some cases. So we wanted it to work well in the mountains. That's often the most difficult place to, uh, because of the heterogeneity. And uh, so things in it are already or wind flow over complex terrain, slope and aspect for radiation, terrain shading by remote mountains, uh, redistribution of snow by gravity, that's avalanching or blowing snow, redistribution such as built what was built in years ago into the uh, snow dash system, uh, the full snow canopy interactions, frozen soils, depressional storage, and then the rest of hydrology as well, right down into the groundwater system. The, um, the tins and how they're represented, uh, this is showing topographic and vegetational constraints. And uh, so you can see that the uh, where we have large constraints on them, uh, we have very small tins, uh, lots of action. It's also showing the constraints offered by this stream, the stream network in this particular example, uh, where things are less constrained then the tins can become a little bit larger. One thing it's uh, uh, quite quite cool in it, and uh, you know we've always had problems with wind flow over complex terrain for uh, snow calculations, evapotranspiration calculations, and uh, and and others in the uh, in in any hydrological model, and it's really hard to get those wind fields right. If you don't correct the wind field, then uh, you know the model just sees a, a simple smear and there are some empirical methods floating around that we found fail in the uh, high mountains and on a regular basis. So um, uh, the uh, this uses wind mapper, which is a pre-computed computational fluid dynamics model to downscale the winds and you just do it for various directions and then you have that as a library that you can look up. So it's it's computationally efficient. It can be applied to large uh, to large areas and important to get the convergence and divergence of winds in there as well. Um, you know, often you, you might go to fine scales in wharf with a, a large eddy simulation. Uh, this is uh, even better than that for uh, these wind wind fields in complex terrain. And uh, this is an example and it's quite scalable. This is uh, uh, this is 1.3 million square kilometers uh, running a wind field library. Uh, what you see is a bit of Vancouver Island, Washington State. Um, British Columbia and Alberta, the Canadian Rockies going down into Glacier Park in Montana and down into Idaho here and then zooming in on one small part of it. You can see the wind flow acceleration on the ridge tops here. Um, and the uh, um, and so Wind Ninja has done a very nice job of showing the acceleration there and the deceleration, the backflows in the in the valleys uh, and that's where the snow gets deposited. Um, or we might have in the summertime uh, reduced evapotranspiration in those calm valleys in uh, in British Columbia and Alberta in this case. So that's uh, that's kind of exciting and because we have a simulation like that for the wind, then we can do a really nice job on blowing snow. So blowing snow uh, models uh, were developed originally uh, in our group in the 1980s. Uh, they ended up in the SnowDAS uh, product by the National Weather Service on one kilometer grid. Uh, at least the sublimation is uh, the redistribution between grid cells is not. And we found that that causes uh, snow dash failure in the Rockies. So this is a newer development we call PBSM 3D. It's a three dimensional blowing snow uh, model, including redistribution and transport. It works in the mountains. And um, in this case, the uh, uh, control volume is applied to the tin. And here's an example you see over the Canadian Rockies where we showed those wind uh, calculations and now you're seeing uh, drift, snow drift calculations. You see the drift uh, where the snow is blowing off the ridge tops and uh, it's uh, where is it blowing into? It's blowing into cornices and that's going to feed the avalanche model because that will then avalanche down off the cornices. That's important because it drops the snow into lower elevations where it uh, melts uh, in uh, vast deep accumulations that linger well into summer or it may feed a glacier and it's pretty hard to model a glacier unless you have these processes in place. So that's uh, so that's all in the uh, system as an example one of the processes. Uh, critically it's been built around a, a coupler and the uh, the coupler is very flexible. It supports different granularity of components from uh, process components to specific flux parameterizations. 
So, and uh, what do I mean by that? Well, there's there's different ways you could link components into a, a flexible system like this. One is to throw in, say, a canopy module or a soils module or a snow module in a very coarse uh, uh, way uh, where it does it all. But the other is to break it up into processes where we have uh, the, the canopy interception or evapotranspiration separately in there. And then you can even go uh, finer where we look at different stomatoconductance regimes, uh, different ways of calculating canopy, uh, wetted fraction, radiative transfer calculations to the canopy, and then calculations or decisions about how we handle through fall drainage and unloading of snow from the canopy. So, um, so these different levels of granularity give us tremendous flexibility in how we couple things into the model. And so we can do it in a very SUMA-like uh, fashion where we have uh, very detailed decisions brought together and then uh, can solve them using uh, partial differential equations. We can also do uh, something that's closer to the cold regions hydrological model or mesh approach where we have larger components that are coupled together uh, but not necessarily uh, supporting a joint solver. And these can support a different computational grids. So the grids, the tins can be different at the surface and the subsurface, which is also very useful when we're bringing uh, groundwater systems where we know perhaps less about them onto surface water systems. The um, numerical solutions in the coupler, as I mentioned, uh, we can, uh, this is an example of a way we could bring things together. Uh, this helps us better handle operating uh, splitting. It helps us standardize the numerical methods we're using. It helps us monitor the time stepping and operating splitting errors. And it also allows us to implement targeted numerical methods for groups of equations and minimizing wasted computational error and efforts. Um, and so you can see the data flow through here. Uh, here we can use SUMA Canopy to set the flux parameterization decisions. We use the coupler. Uh, with selected state equations corresponding to those flux calculations. It solves the equation. Snowball is a bit of a bigger lump. It's uh, from uh, Danny Marks and Jeff Dozier in the uh, USDA. It performs its own numerical solutions. And then the coupler would have a standard coupler that could take it to the soils routines out of CRIM, which include frozen soils and groundwater and things like that. So you can do things on and on like that and create a very, very flexible system as a result. So uh, CHM also has uh, uh, varied interpolation and downscaling routines. Uh, this is the Yukon territory we're showing here, and this is just downscaling the temperature output from a 2.5 kilometer GEM model run from Environment Canada, and we're downscaling it to uh, much finer resolutions here um, and onto slopes and elevations. So uh, we have a spatial interpolation routines in there, uh, very elapsed rates approaches for downscaling, and we can uh, downscale uh, and recalculate radiation, precipitation, uh, wind fields already mentioned, um, temperatures, humidities, uh, other components to drive the models at a variable resolution. And Yukon's a big place, right? It's a, about the size of Germany. So uh, this is uh, also computationally very fast, which is helpful. So I'm going to show you an example of the most sophisticated parts of CHM as it stands right now. Uh, we're building it out to a complete hydrological model, but we wanted to get the difficult snow parts right before we proceeded. And that's what we've been working on. So uh, I'm going to uh, show you basically CHM as a sophisticated multi-resolution snow model. And uh, so what do we need to predict snow dynamics? Well, we have to know the terrain. We have to know where the vegetation is. We have to calculate the snow cover and we have to drive it with the meteorology. And sometimes we have really complex situations. This cornice here is above Fortress Mountain. It's the size of several, a couple school buses in size, and that's going to avalanche down. And in fact, if you saw the movie The Revenant, this is exactly the cornice that avalanche down uh, on them while they're having to fight in that movie. So, um, uh, the uh, so things like that we have to get right sometimes. We have to deal with funny looking trees like this or big forests as we see over the side, slope and aspect, different wind fields, and uh, we, we need ways to bring in uh, meteorological observations where we have them available. Um, so the uh, we, we've assembled a CHM model uh, for this in the Rockies that has uh, blowing snow, uh, intercepted snow, avalanching, sublimation, snowmelt energetics, shading, variable wind flow, downscaling of uh, weather uh, models. Uh, in this case, the weather model is from Environment Canada. 
And so the, the test area is uh, uh, from a this is from a paper recently published by Vincent Vionet and colleagues in the cryosphere. And uh, we used uh, airborne LIDAR from uh, Brian Menounos' group at UNBC to test this. So this is in the uh, Canadian Rockies, uh, southwest of Banff National Park. And we had uh, different zones in here. Some of it's glaciated, some of it's forested, some of it's alpine, and we have some research stations around there as well. And, um, and then we uh, just broke it into some groups here for uh, testing, but we'll zoom into a bit of this as well uh, to show you a bit more. Uh, the LIDAR data covered the red area we have in here. So uh, this is one of the stations uh, we're able to use to uh, test this sort of modeling with and gives you an idea of the topography around there. OK, so you need to drive it with good meteorology, and so we use Environment Canada's high resolution deterministic prediction system, which you've heard about already. This is the operational 48 hour forecast product at two and a half kilometer resolution. It uses the CalDAS for initial conditions, and um, so we drove it with that. And then we downscaled it. Um, uh, these are mesh uh, tins with a 15 meter uh, vertical tolerance. And so we ended up uh, over this uh, area with uh, uh, just over 100,000 triangles uh, covering that area. So you can see the high mountains through here and Fortress Mountain sort of up in here. Um, Hague glaciers down in here. Uh, so anyway, these were as small as 50 meters and as uh, by 50 meters and as large as 250 by 250 meters in this application. We um, and here's some results and we tried some model falsification in here to say, you know, do we really need to involve the blowing snow and the avalanche mechanics in this model? Uh, that stuff's computationally expensive. Uh, do we need to do it? And so on the left, you see the model running with blowing snow and avalanche and turned off. So there are elevational effects on precipitation, temperature, humidity, wind speed and um, and shadings in there. Uh, but uh, on the right, it's also adding blowing snow redistribution, sublimation and avalanching to it. And uh, you see the uh, snow distributions we're getting and how they linger into the yeah. summer are vastly different. And this is very important hydrologically because these remaining snow drifts were uh, critical in the rain on snow event that caused the Calgary flood of 2013, which remains the most expensive flood based natural disaster in Canadian history. And it rained on snowpacks that were still around in late June. And a model that averages things out just isn't going to leave snow at those elevations in any uh, uh, realistic way at that time. So we we know we need to have this information into the models and need to bring this forward. And we're seeing that when we redistribute the snow. The uh, we can compare this to lidar, and so the area on the <clears throat> left hand panel is the lidar image and uh, of uh, showing the uh, snow depths. Uh, deeper blue is deeper snow up to four meters on the LIDAR. And on the right hand panel, uh, we have the model outputs uh, with um, uh, blowing snow and uh, avalanching snow turned on. And uh, uh, basically, they're very similar and they, uh, they're not perfectly similar at, at, by any standpoint, uh, but they uh, share many uh, similar uh, stat uh, statistical properties and elevational properties and lapse rate. Uh, properties uh, hip, over the hypsometry of these basins, which is what we need for accurate prediction. And this paper has just come out in the cryosphere. Um, so Vincent Vionet and a group of co-authors and uh, so the DOI is there, but you can look it up. It's a it's kind of fun paper. It means we've kind of nailed mountain snow prediction in really tough environments with this method. Uh, we've also gone in and set up CHM as a, a operational test product we call Snowcast. And so it's a simple version of what we have there, and uh, you can just go on to snowcast.ca and see it um, as it's set up right now, just over a small area west of Calgary. Uh, the thing is that we can move continentally with this uh, now, and, um, and in fact, we can move globally with this. And we can uh, also uh, undertake long-term runs with uh, some confidence as the uh, um, runs I showed you before involve. You know, we, we've looked at uh, a simulation of information into this from things like airborne LIDAR or remote sensing, and that would certainly help. Um, but the uh, the simulations that we tested against LIDAR were pretty good, and so we're going to be doing a bit more of that over uh, uh, the uh, next uh, few years as we build out the rest of the model with many of the components that Martin talked about in his talk earlier. 
So uh, in the interest of time, I'll wrap up here. I just say that, well, the Canadian hydrological model has some good snow capabilities and structure, and uh, its coupling is uh, very flexible and leads us in a, a very nice setup for moving rapidly towards full hydrological capabilities, and that's where we're headed. The um, one thing that's a, a rather cool aspect of it is that to, to get snow in ET calculations right, we need wind fields in complex terrain, and wind mapper uh, shows great promise for that. The, um, we can successfully model three-dimensional snow physics in multiple resolutions over large area for snow predictions. Uh, these are some of the modules that we link together in CHM uh, to do this. And um, certainly while data simulation from airborne LIDAR, Landsat or Sentinel-2, you know, some of the uh, uh, optical products uh, which give a snow covered area would doubtlessly improve CHM simulations and predictions, but are not necessary to break the mountain snowpack. And that's important because we don't have operational LIDAR uh, from airborne craft in Canada, and we probably can't afford it uh, given the size of our country. Um, it would be uh, immensely expensive to try something like that. And we think it's far better to work it out from physics and have some good models and do it that way. And that's where we're headed. So I thank you very much and uh, wrap it up there. Right, so now I've got to figure out how to unsure. It's on, it's, uh, not sure where that picture is, but it uh, doesn't look very snowy to me. No, it's not very snowy. Okay, <laughs> uh, my unfamiliarity with Teams and I'm having trouble unsharing this. There we are. Uh, no, you're still shared, I think. Right. In, uh, where you see L space in that little window, there's a little uh, screen with an X in it next to the hang up button. Click yeah, the little screen. Top, yes. top right there next to the lead button. That's it. All right, it's done. Okay, okay. Great. great. Thank you very much. Okay, so any any quick questions for John? Thanks, John. That was a great talk. It's exciting, exciting stuff for sure. So appreciate that. Any quick questions for John? I see one from Fred, actually. Is that right? Go ahead, Fred. Yes. John, thanks. Great presentation. It seems like your uh, triangular, your 10 base snowmelt scheme might go very nicely into our framework. It would be fun to follow up with that. I, I think it'd be great to look at these things. The, uh, you know, we're doing it using open source software and uh, we're very interested in collaborations. Um, our feeling is that a lot of these things are really becoming model agnostic. And we bring the greatest strengths from various schemes into each other and, uh, and uh, it can trade off our uh, our tricks and our uh, capabilities and develop the uh, models that we need for true global application. That's right. And I think we can maybe stop reinventing the wheel so many times. Every model, you know, that's developed in the past all has its own data standards and its own workflow. If we can start to unify those things, then, then we can focus on what's really important. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Couldn't agree more. Thanks for that, Fred. I think uh, Martin brought some of those points up too, as did you, Fred. So may maybe the MOU is an opportunity to do that, and we can discuss that on, in, over the next couple of days, the ECC NOAA one, and maybe we expand that somehow. So these are all great points. Okay, thanks, John. Um, Thank you. And so we'll go on to the next speaker here. So, um, so now we're going into the sort of more... Um, operational aspects of flood forecasting, I guess, talking about things like chips and views and, and other details. And I'm sure there's lots of uh, interest from the provinces and territories around some of this infrastructure. So um, it looks like we've got uh, David giving the next talk. So yeah. David, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. First of all, sound check. Can you hear me OK? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. OK, excellent. And with any luck at all, you should be seeing the opening slide, I hope. Yes, it's all good, thanks. Excellent, good, thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you all this afternoon uh, from up here or eastern part of New England uh, in North Massachusetts. Uh, my name is David Valley. I'm the hydrologist in charge for one of the 13 river forecast centers that serve our nation's water resource and forecasting needs. Uh, so this afternoon, I'm just gonna talk briefly about uh, our operational use and implementation of CHIPS FUSE, the Community Hydrologic Prediction System, with FUSE, of course, being the uh, what's in the underbelly of this remarkable system that we've had the good fortune of utilizing over the last 10 or 12 years. So my presentation, I'm going to touch upon our pathway just to give you a very brief historical perspective of, of the efforts that were involved to first build this 
cooperative and collaborative group of, of entities uh, that helped us launch this initiative. Uh, and then really go into the, the meat and potatoes of this being some of her operational uses and the remarkable visualizations that have really, really transformed how we in the River Forecast Centers uh, are able to do our job on a day-to-day -day basis. And then I'm going to end with a partnership, a really great example of how this truly has become a community uh, architecture for us uh, with, uh, with the wonderful relationship that we've had for many years and continue to foster with our friends up in New Brunswick province in their River Watch Center. So first, a little bit of that history. Uh, back in the early 2000s, it became quite evident to the National Weather Service at that time, the Office of Hydrologic Development, that the architecture that we had been standing our forecast operations up on for decades by that time uh, was becoming quite outdated. Uh, it was not going to provide us the architecture and the capability to expand, to do things in a more collaborative way, uh, and to allow us to access other modeling architectures that were out there. Uh, the first one that comes to mind that I'm very close to is the Army Corps of Engineers HECRAS modeling, for example, uh, where we've been able to implement that on complex lakes and in our tidal estuaries over the last decade. So in 2005, the decision was made that we would do an investigation as a National Weather Service to look at various candidates and groups that wanted to come to the table with an architecture that we might be able to utilize. And in 2006, after an exhaustive look and demonstration of a couple of different opportunities, Adelph Fuse was selected as our candidate to develop the first demonstration system. Uh, by 2007, we had pilots stood up at the Northwest River Forecast Center in Portland, Oregon, and uh, the Arkansas River Basin uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. By 2008, the National Weather Service had agreed to move forward with this nationally. Uh, a risk reduction demonstration was set up, which brought in the California Nevada River Forecast Center and my office here in the Northeast River Forecast Center. And after a couple of years of evaluation, development, testing, uh, we launched this operationally uh, starting in 2010-2011. So a couple of the requirements that we came to the table with when we work with uh, Delphius and Deltaris was that our forecast nature is that we're very, very much hands-on from dealing with the forcings to dealing with the actual underbelly of the river forecast process, uh, being able to modify certain parameters and parameterizations on the fly to help us uh, get a more accurate forecast, uh, dependent upon the trends that we're seeing and inaccuracies and forcings and so on. So we call this our mods capability or basically a forecaster modifier interface. This one single addition that was built into the architecture really changed the entire dynamic of how we operationally are able to now so effectively engage in the forecast process on an hour by hour, location by location basis. Uh, this was developed in partnership by having our actual forecasters in the development ring uh, being able to test the different iterations of this particular um, addition to the computational engine. Uh, we also had requirements, of course, to be able to port in many of the operational components that we were utilizing at the time, such as the Weather Services Snow 17 model, unit hydrograph theory, uh, the handful of different routing techniques. Uh, here in the Northeast, we uh, utilized LAG and K, for example. And then one of the biggest ones was to transition us from flood wave to the HECRAS architecture uh, developed and owned and operated by the Army Corps of Engineers to actually develop wrappers to allow us to configure what we need to in our, in our different tidal reaches or complex riverways, and then to be able to utilize and run HECRAS as part of our workflow uh, to get forecast out for some of our tidal downstream river locations, for example. And then um, I have to say that another huge milestone for our agency uh, was reached about two years ago. Uh, my office relocated from a, a facility we had been in for about 25 years up into that time and relocated to a new facility here in Norton, Massachusetts. By that time, my office had been one of a handful of river centers that was demonstrating a full service backup capability where our CHIPS fuse instances were actually running at the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama in time for my relocation. So in that particular event, uh, my office was one of the first in the nation to actually leverage this new connectivity so that we actually sent our forecasters to our regional headquarters on Long Island and they were able to patch into the water center systems and actually run our chips fuse instance remotely to do our forecasting uh, for the week-long activity of relocating our facility. So again, none of this really would have happened without this unique partnership uh, and our ability uh, to build such a complex infrastructure. So I want to go into uh, some of the 
unique visualizations that we utilize now on a day-to-day -day basis. First and foremost, I'm one of those smaller river forecast center areas or domains, if you will. I've got a little over 200 forecast locations, uh, but I got a little bit of everything. Uh, I get to send some water to Canada uh, through the Great Lakes drainages and into the, into the St. Lawrence and St. John. Uh, but we also have to deal with 6,000 foot mountainous terrain, uh, flash floods in some of these faster responding watersheds, the complexities of canals in central New York and down the Mohawk and Hudson rivers. And then of course, a handful of tidal estuaries where we have some really large impacts from, from tidal storm surges. So situational awareness for us is a huge thing to be able to get to in an instant. And we've developed this one particular situational awareness display for each one of our forecast groups. This one in particular is Lake Champlain. And in this one snapshot, you have everything from real-time validation of where your forecast is and how it's performing to date as well as giving you a snapshot of what is observed from a river flood standpoint to what we are forecasting on order of magnitude. So the circles are representing the deviation uh, that the observations are from our official forecast at a given moment in time. And then the squares that you see with the various shadings are indicative of the flood status, action, minor, moderate, or major flooding. If one of the hydrologists that's operating on that particular day clicks on one of the circles, it'll bring them right to our main forecast hydrographs where they can begin to interrogate and, and begin to forecast or update that particular point. Uh, another way about our, our business is to be able to look at the many forcings that we drive the hydrology with. This is one example of our basin average precipitation forecasts. And again, for the river centers across the nation, we are focused on watersheds that typically are between 80 and 100 square miles or larger, and ones that typically respond in about six hours or greater from the incident rainfall event. We have these types of displays for the past precipitation on six hour time steps. We can accumulate over multiple days. These particular images uh, through the CHIPS graphical architecture, we are able to then push to our web pages uh, across the country as well. We have similar types of analyses for temperature forcings, past and future temperatures, and a few others that I'll show you as well. So again, this is kind of looking at things in a spatial sense. And this is what the forecasters are looking at every single day. This is one example from the Winooski River up in central Vermont that feeds into Lake Champlain. Uh, and you're looking at our main forecast interface window that the forecasters are looking at and utilizing every day. This particular watershed is one that is broken up into high terrain above 2,000 uh, feet and a lower level or low terrain, low elevation. So we break up our Sacramento soil moisture model into these different elevational components. And in the CHIPS interface, we're able to uh, create these forcings uh, uh, graphics like you see here where we have the temperature as the uh, dashed line you see here in blue, both the past temperatures through our analyses and the future temperatures over the next three to five days. We do the same thing for observed precipitation. Now here in New England, because of the complexities of beam blockage due to radars, uh, the mixed precipitation events we get throughout the year, we mindfully actually maintain two precipitation analyses year round, one of which is derived solely from the real-time rain gauge reports, the second one is a mosaic of our radar estimates and our real-time hourly gauges. So our forecasters have the ability through that modifier interface that I showed earlier to actually switch which time series is driving the past or driving the future, uh, depending on the, the course of events during that particular day. And then down here is the main forecast window where the black dots indicate the river observations, uh, the purple here represents our simulation and our official forecast. And then all of the contributing inflows that we forecast for are provided in these other traces that you see here. Again, past to the left of the red line and future going forward. And they're all listed here for reference purposes. So this gives you a sense in real time uh, of how our forecasters are able to so effectively interact with our modeling uh, by way of this tremendously powerful visualization that is present within the FUSE architecture. And I, I feel having, you know, been in this office since 2007 and seeing this remarkable revolution of how we do things, that we're still just scratching the surface uh, with the power behind what this architecture can bring us. Another real nice handy asset that Fuse gives us is this plot overview concept, where as I showed you earlier in that prior slide, our main forecast window, which is actually represented by this one here in the upper left, we have all of these other thumbnails, which by the click of a mouse come into the main frame. 
Uh, we have everything from a past forecast comparison, so we can see how our current forecast is relating to our earlier issuances. We're able to bring in the National Water Model guidance in, all, in its short and medium range runs to look at our official forecast against various runs of the water model over the last uh, several days. We can look at our Sacramento model states, the upper zone tension to the deep uh, surface layer water. We can look at uh, our ensemble predictions coming from the NAFES, the global forecast system, and more recently, the addition of our new hydrologic ensemble forecast service. And the beauty of this for the forecasters is that we are overlaying our official simulation right smack dab in the middle of those ensemble predictions. So it really gives them you know, a different level of confidence being able to interact while they're forecasting uh, with some of this ensemble prediction. And then, of course, we have what I call the poor man's version, where we actually just drop the raw, untouched model QPF from everything from our high-res rapid refresh uh, to the global forecast system in the Euro and some of the Canadian members, uh, so that we just push those raw temperature and precipitation forcings into our river model to come up with uh, what I call a poor man's ensemble of the real-time operational systems. Uh, you can see here too, we have some of our long range 90 day prediction here. Uh, if we were to run contingency forecasts for our partners, we can get a quick look at it here in the lower right. And then of course, this annual peak stages plot. This is very powerful. When we're forecasting, it's always good to give yourself a sanity check, as I like to say, to make sure that what you're forecasting makes sense if you're looking at major or moderate flooding. Is this the type of system that we really believe is going to rank up there with some of the top peak flow events uh, in the period of record for any one of our river gauges. So this, this plot overview here is just a huge addition, again, to our ability to interact uh, with so many different parameters and so many different outputs in real time. So just a couple of snapshots for you here. This is one example of the plot of our national water model simulations with the short range runs up top, some of the medium range runs in, in this middle window, and even some of the long range ensembles here in the bottom window. Again, it gives us an opportunity to bring in this real time very rich data set from the national water model and put it right in our forecasters hands, overlaying our official simulations with it. So we can see where our forecast at our major forecast locations is sitting within the envelope of potential uh, based on the national water model. And this has really been an effective way uh, for us operationally of getting the national water model right in front of our forecasters in real time. This is a more expanded or blown up version of what we're looking at when we look at some of the ensemble guidance. On the left is our hydrologic ensemble forecast ensemble members, uh, some 60 traces of temperature and uh, precipitation that have gone through uh, a series of preprocessor algorithms to get us this family of hydrographs here. And then to the right, we're taking every one of the 42 members of the NAFES in temperature and precipitation, downscaling them through our basins and then forcing those through our operation river forecasting systems to come up with 42 simulations. All of this is repackaged through a graphical uh, package that we have to push these types of images for our partners out to our website. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the MMEFS is what we call it, our meteorological member-based ensemble forecast system online. We have both these plots from the GFS, the NAFES, as well as the HEFS now. And they're all of the computational components are driven under the hood in chips. And then we simply post-process that data to get it out into graphics uh, for our partners on the web page. I referenced the annual peak stages earlier. This gives you a, a blown up version of what our forecasters see. So for instance, the uh, most recent forecast would be this magenta bar in the far right of the right-hand graphic. But then you're seeing that against the historical peaks for every water year uh, in the period of record for a particular gauge. On the left is a new addition that we've made over the last year, where we have cataloged anywhere from three to as many as 10 historical events, so that when we're forecasting a moderate or major episode, our forecasters can go into one of the library icons and actually bring into the forecast window the actual observations, so we can see the shape and the behavior of the hydrograph for, for past flood events. Uh, this has been tremendously powerful over the last couple of winters when we'll be dealing with rapid snow melt. We've got a couple of cases that we know the rises were a result of such events and allowing the forecasters to have that opportunity in real time right in their forecast interface to actually be able to toggle on and off some of the historical floods has really made an improvement uh, operationally and from a situational awareness standpoint too uh, in our forecasting in some of these more rapid onset events. So two different ways of incorporating some of the historical data uh, for many of our forecast points. 
going back to some of the situational awareness spatial displays here, we're on the left-hand side, you're looking at how we bin up the snow water equivalent on a basin average. Uh, we bring in not only the actual uh, analyses from our SNOW-17 model, but we also bring in uh, the SNOW-DAS analysis and we have uh, delta grids or difference grids, if you will. And we actually, as some of you may attend actually, the calls that we do every Thursday with no risk uh, in our fellow river forecast centers in the Northern tier uh, to talk about what their model is seeing, what our SNOW-17 model is seeing, working with our partners to help uh, square away and to get our models as best uh, situated for the next melt event, looking at just the snow water equivalent. We also have uh, images that show the future melt on a basin average over the next three days. And then on the right-hand side is one example of two analyses we do using the Stefan equations at each one of our gauged locations to calculate a season running ice thickness graphic, which you see here, uh, again, post-process for our web purposes. But we also do one using thawing degree days to estimate when ice breakup may occur. Uh, looking at a low likelihood, moderate, or high likelihood, again, based on um, the Stefan equations that we run in the background in chips. So again, a couple of really unique uh, ways for our forecasters to, to get their hands around some of, these, uh, some of these types of variables. We have quite a bit of a real-time verification running in real time behind the scenes in chips that, again, is incorporated into the forecaster interface. We can look at event by event um, QPF verification the rainfall that drove the particular forecast. Uh, the one on the left I chose was to show you a broader 30-day average of our official rainfall forecast driving the model versus our gauge only analysis. And then on the right-hand side is one of the newer additions where we're actually running every day a real-time national water model validation and bidding this up over the last 30 days for our forecasters to have a sense of what the performance of the water model has been uh, for any one of our river basins that we forecast for. I alluded to earlier just how big of an impact it had when we were able to transition from flood wave to HECRAS. Uh, this is an example that, that illustrates just how important this addition has been. Uh, we are utilizing this in my center uh, for Lake Champlain uh, due to the sage on the lake. And we are also utilizing it on some of our larger tidal rivers, such as the Hudson, the Connecticut, the Merrimack, Kennebec, and Penobscot rivers in real time. The beauty behind this uh, is that because of the chips uh, data ingest fields and the way that we've developed our modifier interface, we can bring in any number of tidal boundary conditions and the forecasters in real time have the opportunity to select which particular boundary condition we want to run with on any particular day. We have a Gulf of Maine model, the National Ocean Service in New York City has one running. Uh, we have east offs, we have the ETSS, the ET surge model. Uh, Stevens Institute, one of our partner academic institutions, uh, shares their real-time forecasting system for New York Harbor with us so we can bring in their tidal boundary condition. Uh, and during hurricanes, we actually ingest uh, the probabilistic surge guidance from the National Hurricane Center. Uh, we can select from a 10%, 30% uh, or 50% probability of exceedance, for example. And the forecaster in real time can determine which one uh, we want to use. For hurricanes, we actually coordinate that with the National Hurricane Center before we go ahead and complete our model simulations for any particular model run. But here you're looking at the battery itself. You know, the tidal models for Sandy did struggle. They were about two to three feet off. But what we found by running hack grass is once that tidal surge was observed at the battery at the entrance to the Hudson River, uh, our, our instance of HECRAS running on the tidal Hudson provided 8 to 12 hours lead time, and we nailed the crest at both Poughkeepsie and Albany, New York. Consider Albany is 151 miles from the mouth. Uh, we nailed that crest within just a couple of inches uh, with, like I said, anywhere from 8 to 12 hours lead time. So we are running this operationally in real time, and it, it's really been a huge asset and a tremendous improvement on our forecasting on these tidal reaches. So uh, lastly, I just wanted to finish up with um, a wonderful partnership. We have had the good fortune of working so closely with the Riverwatch Center in New Brunswick Province up in Fredericton now for several decades. Uh, many success stories with them. Most recently though, after coming to our center and seeing how we have evolved the CHIPS Fuse system operationally, they entered an agreement and adopted Fuse as their new architecture in 2017. Uh, it's really opened the doors to our ability in real time to share forcings, to share time series data. Um, and an example you see here from the St. John River during one high flow event 
uh, back in 2017. where well, you can see their uh, forecast here in this green dashed line, our official simulation overlaid with the observations, some of the inflow tributaries. This has really changed the way we work together because now we can be looking at each other's forecast in real time. Before either center goes ahead and issues their public forecast, we now have the opportunity to collaborate in real time with them in this new architecture. Uh, we've enjoyed over the last several years the opportunity also to have some forecaster exchanges. Uh, one of my forecasters, who's now our development and operations hydrologist, uh, Allison McNeil, has gone up there on almost an annual basis to work with their staff to share some of what we've done and to help them incorporate some of this into their instance. And likewise, we've had their staff come down here almost as frequently. Um, the last time we had them here was in November of 2019 where three of their forecasters came down and spent uh, three days with us, shadowing our forecasters so we got to know one another and then learning and seeing how we've expanded our use of fuse that they can take back with them to implement uh, for their river forecast office. So uh, with that, uh, I will be happy to take uh, any questions and uh, I will stop sharing at this moment. Great, thanks, David. Thanks for ending on a nice um, uh, international tone in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Appreciate that. So uh, I think we should go straight to, to Dave, and then maybe we'll have a bit of time to take a couple of sort of fuse types questions um, for bo for both David and Dave, two Daves. Um, and uh, so those of you who don't know, Dave, Dave is the Delteris rep who's now doing his PhD in Canada, but he's still working for Delteris part time, and um, and uh, he's also doing his PhD with Martin and myself and John and a few others at uh, University of Saskatchewan. So he's uh, going to give a little bit of an overview on um, where we've gone with the um, the mesh modeling system and Fuse and a few other details. Dave, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction, Al. Uh, as we would have it fun in live presentations. I actually see that my share content isn't loading. Uh, so in that case, I might ask Evan to share his screen uh, as a last minute technical fix here. It would be great to give a, a quick presentation with no slides. Um, but uh, Evan, if possible, if you could bring up your screen, I, uh, my own doesn't seem to be loading. Not a problem, just give me a moment. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, so yeah, really wonderful presentation so far. Uh, David, thank you for the one that is a really nice introduction to this one. Um, as Al mentioned, I'm sort of wearing two hats these days. Uh, one is starting as a PhD student, which is fun. I'm supervised by Martin Clark at the Coldwater Laboratory as part of University of Saskatchewan, and that takes up most of my time. Uh, and then also I still work for Delteris, which is an applied research institute and a non-for-profit based in the Netherlands. Uh, and Delteris is the developer of Delfuse, or we see a lot used as Fuse as just a, a short-term holder for that. Um, so today I'm going to give a presentation uh, which is talking, uh, yeah, just about Delfuse applications specifically in Canada, uh, and it's really my, my pleasure to do so. Um, so Evan, I'll ask you to go ahead. Uh, you'll probably have to click a fair bit because uh, I have some animations. So uh, as an introduction to my presentation here, I'm going to talk a little bit about Delfuse and specific to Canada use. Uh, and then I want to talk about how we can use uh, all these developments that we're talking about in this forum to really advance the practice of flow forecasting. And I would like to talk about enabling forecasters to use their local knowledge and their local models in place, um, how we can use this incredible availability of data into actual decision making and talk a little bit about a community of practice. Uh, and then because I am a PhD now and get to start with more questions and answers, I'll put a couple questions out to the forum. So next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an overview of what Delfuse is. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with it, uh, really what it is is an open data handling framework. Uh, and it's built to be specific to the to the forecasting process. So we know that there's a lot of moving parts in generating hydrological forecasts. You really need to be effectively able to bring in a wide variety of data. You need to be able to process and validate that data. And the power of Delfuse is able to run individual models uh, and particularly being able to interact with those models. Uh, but it's really open and agnostic, as we've heard talk of agnostic infrastructure. That is a philosophy that Delph uses, which is why it has so much uptake in that people can apply their own models in 
at the same time using a variety of data sources and then also being able to share that information out uh, with the public. So it's important that it's built on a shared development philosophy. So if one organization, forecasting organization, needs an enhancement, then they will fund it, and then that will be available to the whole broad community. Um, and there's a quite strong community behind Delphuse by now, both in North America, uh, particularly we saw those 13 river forecasting centers is very strong, and uh, the next image is also gonna show in Canada as well. So we can go to that next image. Oh, uh, just for fuse developments in general, uh, there's a lot that occurs every year. I'm not gonna talk about that a lot in this presentation. Uh, if you want more information on it, you can simply look up Dell Fuse 2002 uh, and you can get a lot of the recent developments that have occurred. I would bring up there's been a lot of development on running scenarios. So sort of being able to run what if with your model and compare those. Uh, I think really impressive is the open archive, well, which this uh, sort of diagram illustrates, which is the ability to have a library of NetCDF files that you can then access and use. So you can create those yourselves, or you can bring in external libraries of NetCDF and use it seamlessly within your system. And the last part is we just see a lot of fuse uh, instantiations in the cloud. So as a lot of services go to cloud, also a lot of uh, people are choosing now to run their Delphi fuse in a separate cloud, as opposed to their own uh, infrastructure. And that's becoming much more normal. So if we go to the next slide, we can look at an overview of uh, Delphi's uh, systems that are operating in Canada. So this is largely all operational systems, uh, with the exception of some of our territories, which are just looking at a pilot. But what we see is sort of a fairly broad base now of what our provincial and territorial forecasters. Um, but in areas where that's not the case, we also see a lot of use by utilities and specifically hydropower. So that's also been sort of a, a driving force along with the, the uptake in, in provincial and territorial forecasters, also with uh, hydropower. So I apologize to Water, Water Security Agency. They're really building an incredible and wonderful system, but they were the latest. So now they end up as an overlay. <laughs> But you can see really some broad base uh, coverage by a lot of agencies and we're really starting to see a strong community of users growing and a lot of them have the same needs. Uh, next slide please. Okay so we want to sort of I want to formulate uh, how we can look at these three different components to, to try and move forward and I, I think this form is a, a really exciting and excellent place to do that. So we talk about how we can enable the forecasters in these agencies to use their local models and knowledge, how they can use this data to actionable information in the community of practice. So starting with enabling forecasters to use local models and knowledge, uh, we could go to the next slide. Can click a bit forward. I really appreciate your, your uh, help here, Evan. This is a great live presentation to not have it have it show up, but I really appreciate your help. Uh, so what we see in a lot of these Canadian forecasters is that there's a real uptake of, of Canadian use models. Uh, and it's not to be too nationalistic or territorial about it, but simply we see that there's a lot of uh, cold regions processes, which are very complex, and some of them are more unique to northern climates. And we really need to see that encapsulated in a lot of our modeling. And John and Martin have presented that really well. Um, so some of these Canadian-based models are now really finding their way into operational practice. But of course, when we go from scientific domain to operational, it's kind of a different beast. We, we force the model in a different way. We use different data, either live or forecasted. Um, we want forecasters to be able to interact with their models. If there's any sort of shift that they need to correct, they want to manually change that or could use automatic data assimilation. And unlike science, where we can be content by getting a good Nash Sutcliffe efficiency, not everyone is, uh, actually they need to be used to be made decisions. So really a different beast. And we really want to uh, make it easier for these forecasters to use these models, to trust them, uh, and then also to couple them with other capability. Uh, so that's with a lot of HEC models, which are routinely used in Canada as well, uh, to be able to uh, interact with and run scenarios. So they really have a more fine-tuned control as David showed very well uh, and a lot of collaborative work is going on. We can go to the next slide uh, which is really helping to, to integrate these models and we see that it uh, it takes a community really of, uh, of, of scientists, of, of government, of private sector and then also of the of course of the forecasters themselves uh, to be able to build these functional systems. 
I'll highlight that for Raven and Mesh, uh, we're really moving to a much more direct integration of Fuse in these models, whereby Fuse can interact with the state and, and uh, parameters in order to update them. Uh, you don't need a, a model dependency, uh, an adapter dependency between them, and they run directly off standard data formats, which will really make it easier to use and to trust and to uh, maintain, of course, over a longer time. We also really want to be looking more at river ice modeling, the sort of white elephant in the hydrology room, as my colleague Prabin likes to say. Uh, and we want to try and advance that both with collaborations of the University of Laval, uh, partnered with Quebec Public Safety, uh, and also to be working with uh, Global Water Futures USASC, who've been doing a lot of work on river ice forecasting. I'm really excited to see the Newfoundland presentation where I know they've also integrated river ice, riv ice operationally. So that's quite exciting. And again, it's all based around shared development. So we see what happens for one forecasting center, then it becomes easier for the next one to pick up in the next stage. Uh, next slide. So uh, turning large domain into actual actionable information, it's, it's really incredible as a highlight uh, for Environment Canada and NOAA and ECMWF, the operational data that they make available is really incredible. But we need to look what uh, is it that forecasters are looking for? What, what is the information that they actually want to have in their operational practice and will really help them to make decisions? Uh, and in a sort of informal survey to them, you can see sort of surprisingly remote sensing data is quite high. Uh, we see that also having targeted access to gridded data can be quite important and also use of these uh, runoff grids from large domain models. So we're gonna look at that a little bit more. Um, and in the next slide, what we'll see is some of the uh, greatest data that we is now have access to. Part of that is coming in also as the RadarSat Constellation mission, which was recently launched by the Canadian Space Agency. So this is constellation of three satellites, uh, which gives publicly available data, sometimes with a daily overpass over Canada. Uh, and for provincial and territorial forecasters specifically, they can access really high resolution data as well. So it's a really valuable data source that uh, we can start to harness. What we see in the image there is uh, RCM can now be uh, integrated operationally with Delphuse, uh, and we've been involved in a research project in order to use that to identify river ice so that you can have these regularly updated and classified uh, river ice maps in order to help with decision making. And this has been co-funded by Alberta and Quebec. Uh, we have the RCM data operationally, but are looking for new partners really to, to get this classification up and running. So that's a bit still in test phase. And as part of this, we also have Sentinel-1 and 2, which are brought in operationally to the Delphi system. So of course, that's not just the imagery, but that's the underlying data. So we can see what other type of applications they have, particularly for uh, snow modeling and estimation of snow and modeling is very much my own PhD thesis. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, yeah, just again, the incredible amount of information that's uh, been put forth by efforts from Environment Canada and the like uh, really provides a, a huge amount of data. But what we see, and very useful data, but what we see in practice is that provincial and territorial forecasters uh, often use meteorological forcing. Quite often it can be quite simplistic in precipitation and temperature, and they look at snow reanalysis products, snow dust if they're further enough south or globe snow. So as these data becomes available, uh, we need to think of how it can be packaged and how it can be made usable by the end forecasters. And we need to answer some basic questions around it, such as what is the temporal or spatial validity of the forecast? How long is the forecast good for? Um, what is the uncertainty of it? Communicate, uh, ensembles are an excellent way of, of describing that, but also in direct communication to forecasters. So they get an idea of what the quality uh, of these large domain, particularly runoff grids for. And then is this used as a boundary condition model? Does it complement local modeling? I think in David's example, it was a complement, but these are, these are questions that we should address. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, I've come to building a, a community of practice. I think one of the main reasons this forum is, is really timely and, and really wonderful uh, and something that, that we'll discuss over the coming days. I think the, the community of practice can really benefit from having a core technical component to it. So having an engaged members that are part of the technical component, but also we really need to be, of course, engaging the people that are actually making decisions and using the systems. And hopefully we can really 
engage that through training and workshops and exchanges like we've heard. And regular interaction and dialogue, just like maintaining good friendships. This is a really core part of hopefully what will build this community of practice from us. And I really hope that we can also, like this forum, learn from other audiences, even outside of Canada, because we're certainly not alone in this endeavor. And, and many other organizations have, or, or uh, countries have gone through this process, so we can start to learn from them. These slides show also provincial and territorial results of whether they would prefer to be more active and passive in a system like this, and also indicating that the type of training uh, should be both how to build the technical component and then actually how to use the system as well. So I will wrap up shortly here as we are coming to break. Uh, Evan, could you go to the next slide? So uh, just stressing again that we're not alone and there's a huge community of practice out there. Um, we really see that for Delphuse. Uh, there's continued development that goes on and a lot of actually institutional work which uh, has been done. If you're, and along with that, what's going on with the US or the UK or Australia or the Netherlands, who all have these sort of national frameworks, it comes with a lot of investment and a lot of stability uh, and also a very strong user community. If you're interested a, a little bit more about the high level direction of where things are going, you can Google Delphi's Vision 2025. Next slide, please. So uh, I will close out soon with my questions for the community and for the forum, uh, which uh, we have a couple days to discuss, maybe mostly on day three. Uh, and my first one is, how are we going to validate flow forecasts to understand when and how they can be used, and particularly also how to guide investment? So perhaps to improve our forecasts, it can be things that are really low-hanging fruit, maybe it's statistical pre- or post-processing, or maybe we need to invest in a new satellite that measures but we need to sort of be diagnostic in order to determine that. I'm really interested in how this intersection of large domain forecasting and, and particularly runoff and, and streamflow grids uh, will interact with the local models and operational practice, whether it's a blending or complement or boundary condition will be interesting. And finally, there's of course in Canada, very large initiatives as well about uh, the impact mapping and the flood hazard mapping um, that is occurring in the communities. So how can we as a forecasting or predictive community really connect in with what may be occurring at a community level or with critical infrastructure to really better enable uh, what is early warning and, and decision making in these contexts. And to my second to last slide, please Evan. Uh, so wrapping up, uh, I really feel this is a really exciting time. Uh, within the community and what we're doing. Um, I'm really appreciative to the people that are organizing this forum and for everybody for, for contributing. I think that we're gonna make a leap forward uh, in terms of what we're doing here and at a great service to, to the people that live in our country. Um, we're really already living, of course, in a, a paradigm of shared development. We're standing on the shoulders of giants and everything that we're doing. Um, but if we as a community can have better dialogue and planning, if we can more target our efforts and what we all need, uh, then we can really get stronger outcomes. When I talk about Delphuse, it's only one component. And in fact, it's just the infrastructure. There are so many other components from data to modeling to communication that all need to occur. Um, but as we go through with developments, we see that there's a strong user community of Delphuse that we should keep in mind because that is a large part of the forecasting community. And of course, uh, none of this can be done in a vacuum but in dialogue in a, in a forum like this. So thanks again to the organizers. And that's it. Appreciate any questions. Thank you. Okay, great. So we'll, thanks Dave for that. And um, we'll open up the floor to questions for either of the Daves. Um, and I noticed that uh, Khalid Akhtar had a question. So I'll start with Khalid. Uh, thank you, Al. And uh, it's a question for the David uh, from NWS. So I have a quick question for you because you are asking about like you are telling that you guys are using HECRAS hydraulic models. So my question is for the reservoir modeling. As I know you are using RAS chip. Have you changed that to HECRAS same? We are. I believe we're still using the basic HECRAS component. We're not using res. We're not using res sim. Okay. For our reservoirs, we are still using 
our, our own National Lift Service Reservoir modeling right now. And uh, the next associate question, sorry, I'm taking more time. So for the Sacramento model, so are you satisfied with the performance of the uh, like uh, Sacramento model or you are thinking to go in another direction? Right now, uh, for the size of the watersheds that we're forecasting for, uh, we have really solid performance with Sacramento, with SAC SMA. Uh, it, I think it has stood the test of time for the purposes of what we're trying to use it for. Uh, but I think with time and with the, the maturation of the national water model, uh, I think we're going to see uh, a time come where we're going to begin to utilize the national water model uh, in more instances, uh, and, and especially to cover some of these smaller, flashier river locations that I currently forecast for that kind of fall right on the cusp of that six hour uh, response time. But I think at, once we get our, our, our hands around the next gen um, that Trey and Fred described, I think in a few years, we're going to be at a different point to really begin to investigate how we can begin to leverage the water model more fully into our river forecast center operations than we do right now. But until that time, Sacramento has, has stood the test of time for us. Yes. Thank you, David. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. My pleasure, thank you. Great, thanks, Khaled, that's great. Um, I don't see any other hands, so I think um, we're maybe three minutes, four minutes behind. So so I'd, I'd really like to stick to our guns here with respect to the schedule. So let's um, let's take a, a break till, um, I guess, uh, what do we got here? 14.50 low on the Eastern or Eastern time. Um, and Dorothy Dunford will give a talk on sort of where we're at or where ECC is at with their operational products and services. So Dorothy, if you can line yourself up and then we'll start exactly at um, at 10 uh, 2 and folks can take a quick uh, health break for five minutes, grab a coffee or do whatever. And uh, we'll be back at uh, 1450 on the button. Thank you very much. Um, they've all been really super talks. So really appreciate everybody putting all the effort into the to all of this, so that's been great. Um, and uh, so we'll just continue on here with uh, with sort of going to the operational side again, with ECC and and what's um, what's being produced in terms of products and services um, that uh, hopefully the, the provinces and territories or others will take advantage of over the next little while as this develops. So, um, Dorothy, the floor is yours. Okay, can you can you hear me? First of all. Yes, we can hear you great, and your slides are up, so it's all good. Okay, perfect, okay. So, operational products from ECCC. Uh, the title says and services, but that's more the realm of the predict prediction services directorate. So I'll focus on... a little bit of background information first and then I'm going to go in a timeline. Operational products that are available now, experimental products available now, and what we foresee is coming in the next five or so years. Um, as Vincent mentioned, in our building, the Canadian Meteorological Centre, we're divided into research, development and operations. We all have our specific work that we focus on, whether you're focusing on the new innovations coming to the model or the systems themselves, the robustness or running and monitoring the systems. But what we like to emphasize is that there's a continuous feedback loop of comments and suggestions. So it's a, it's a community project. As in the US, our hydrological products are really just getting going. They're in their infancy. So I provided a timeline to show the progress that we've really started to make in the last few years. Prior to 2012, we had one system, operational, the regional deterministic precipitation analysis. We've then added in more slowly, but from 2016, and suddenly from 
2018, we started delivering a greater variety of services. Plus, when the first delivered their experimental, the operational status is creeping into more of our systems. So we're making progress. All right, so what operational products are available now for those who are forecasting hydrology and floods? Uh, hydrology, to my mind, starts with precipitation. As our colleague from the Northeast River Centre was saying, at the basin-wide precipitation, we provide that from the 2.5 kilometre version. But today I really want to focus on the update that's coming for the 10 kilometre version. Uh, Vincent mentioned it briefly. We're introducing the assimilation of satellite data. It's really important in Canada. Not only are most of our observations in the southern third or half, but a lot of our major river basins and hydropower systems are outside of the data rich area. So the satellite gives us data everywhere. Uh, we find that summer convector precipitation, really hard to get the location right. The satellite data is helping with that. The red is the new version, which will deliver, become operational March or April of this year. We're also better at the amount of precipitation that we've analyzed. So these panels show the confidence index that we have for the version that's currently operational on the left panel and the version that goes online March or April. Where it's green, it means that we only have the model first guess field. And as you go up the color scale, we've added in more observations. So with the new version, we have no data gaps at all, and we've increased the amount of observations everywhere. And as I said, focusing on the northern regions, so this covers the Churchill River domain, the Yukon, the Mackenzie, we're moving from a lot of areas with only model to observations everywhere. And the dark green shows that our confidence in the precipitation analysis is, is increasing quite dramatically. Uh, so we're very pleased. Oh, sorry, the wrong way. All right, surface runoff. We've mentioned that. <clears throat> Why is this of interest? It's because it's the water that enters the rivers rapidly, drives the rapid fluctuations in river flow. Mm. We are now disseminating through data mart and geomet surface runoff as predicted by our global, regional, and high resolution atmospheric prediction systems. So here in the image, we have the six day forecast from the global version. So if you're the person on the ground responsible for forecasting river flows, looking at this, you might say, hmm, I think we'll focus on the rivers in this area first. It gives a heads up. Moving on to the experimental products and but continuing with surface runoff, we have a product that's being built around the global ensemble and regional ensemble atmospheric prediction systems. And what's good about adding them in is that it gives you a measure of probability. So we find with this product, 10 to 15 days out, it can give a, it can give an alert for a major flooding potential situation. We don't actually forecast the floods, but it gives you the potential. When you're at the shorter lead times, you might want to look at one grid point at a time. But when you're further away, you might want to expand your your regional, expand to a regional view by looking at 3.3 or 5.5 boxes. So then if the 20 members agree that something's going to happen for the threshold that you've identified, but they're not agreeing on exactly where it's going to happen. If you move to three by three or 5.5 boxes, you're, you're increasing your chance of seeing consensus. 
so that the probability goes up and you move to the orange and red. And in this system, the user is able to set the thresholds. If you know your rivers are full, you can put your thresholds to lower values. If you know they're getting high, sorry, if you know your rivers are empty, you can put your threshold values much higher. So that's using the information contained in the ensembles. We are, we're asked often for information about the snowpack. We have an experimental product now since last spring to give an idea of the anomaly in our analyzed snow water equivalent. So it's, it's reference to, so what we do is we take the analyzed snow water equivalent from the regional deterministic prediction system, 10 kilometer resolution. We combine that with the 18 year climatology from our new regional reanalysis of the surface and precipitation. Now, we, we're not interested in over the middle of big lakes, so they're blanked out. We're not interested in over purely glacial areas, so the glaciers are blank, blanked out. But otherwise, we find when we look at the observations, the hotspots that this product picks out are justified by the observations. So it gives you an idea of how much water is out there in the snowpack. All right, we have an op uh, operational system, the water cycle prediction system. We combine this with the re regional ensemble wave prediction system. At the moment, these are set up on the Great Lakes and on the Gulf of St. Lawrence. But I'm mentioning them here partly because we do plan to expand these systems and implement them elsewhere. So the water cycle prediction system puts out two forecasts a day, three and a half days each. We're disseminating output via data mart and geomet. So we have over lake near surface atmosphere. We have the fluxes surface from the water surface to the atmosphere. We have the water level. Uh, water temperature and currents actually throughout the column of the water and what the ice cover is doing. We also have an experimental product that provides three and a half day forecasts of storm surge and waves. Uh, we are also planning to disseminate in 2021 surface runoff and the climatological recharge that we use for the river routing model. We calculate for each lake the net basin supply so precip onto the lake surface, evaporation from the lake and the terrestrial runoff. We have our river flows at one kilometers, which we do not disseminate to the public, but it is available uh, for the provinces and territories and for academia. So we provide analyses, three and a half day forecasts. Now for the nationwide system, hydrological system, we have the National Service and River Prediction System. So as Vincent mentioned, the gray region is where we have the land surface and precipitation. And then we have our river routing models covering at the moment in operations, six major river basins. And for this year, we'll deliver the Skeena, which drains to the Pacific, the Columbia, and also the St. John River. So these we've planned to deliver this fall. <clears throat> so the domains to the west are only represented in the National Service and River Prediction System. Um, the domains on the east, the Great Lakes and the Gulf are in both the National Service and River Prediction System and the Water Cycle Prediction System. So uh, Fanson did mention on this, but I'm going to focus on the products that come out of the Surface and River Prediction System. Snowpack is very important. We've been working very hard on improving the analysis and on the cold weather processes. Soil moisture, uh, we assimilate uh, brightness temperatures, SMOS and SMAP. Surface runoff and subsurface lateral flow, which enter the rivers quickly, and also drainage. Uh, this is not climatological drainage because we're using 
the new land surface scheme, snow vegetation, sorry, surface vegetation, snow, or SVS. So 2.5 kilometer horizontal resolution, rivers are one kilometer. Um, net basin supply at the moment uh, is the Laurentian Great Lakes. Uh, this spring will be also providing it for Lake Athabasca, Great Slave, Great Bear Lakes, and Lake Champlain. At the moment, we have analyses and also six day deterministic forecasts. This spring, we're rolling out a 16 day ensemble forecast for the land surface prediction component and also the rivers. It's a once a day forecast, and on Thursdays, it's lengthened out to 32 days. Uh, we're working on dissemination this year by both Datamart and Geomet, the beta versions, since this is an experimental system. So that dissemination this year. Uh, password protected if you're interested in the land surface portion. Uh, so if you're interested in near surface atmospheric temperature, dew point temperature, the winds, the soil moisture, um, you can get that. You'd have to ask for the password. Uh, just a brief word of warning. It doesn't work very well with Explorer, in my experience. So just a brief example of how SPS is working. We have this heavy rain, uh, Halloween storm of fall 2019, up to 100 millimeters along the St. Lawrence River Basin. And I surprise, surprise, there's no surface runoff or subsurface lateral flow in the, in the area of the heaviest rain. Why? It all infiltrated into the top layer of soil. And it hasn't yet in that region made it down into the root zone layer, but closer to the Great Lakes, yes, it's beginning to infiltrate, infiltrate that deep. We also have a hydrodynamic prediction system. I was very interested to see what the US is doing with this, with the national water model. This is a comparable system from what I see for uh, providing the extent of lateral flooding, the wetting and drying. At the moment, we have this system set up on the St. Lawrence. We provide water levels and currents uh, for navigation uh, via the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. It uh, uses an unstructured mesh. So again, where you have your intricate coastlines or the channels with strong chow, strong currents, uh, you're able to increase the resolution to a much, much higher uh, resolution. If this system is depth average, so it's great for the wide rivers and the shallower lakes. Uh, we provide three products, a steady state solution, analyses and two day forecasts. And again, we're working on dissemination. So at the moment, it's a Lawrence River only, but this is where we're setting it up. It doesn't mean we stop there. So products over the next five years, what's coming? In the prairie provinces, we have the prairie potholes. The National Hydrological Service developed a system to use the RCM data or Sentinel-1 data to produce an analysis every second week of the extent of surface water. So our team has been working with the development team. We've now taken delivery of the system, are getting out up to our building standards, and we're working with the experts in the satellite uh, pre-processing system. Uh, we may run it for a few months in a user account. I hope to deliver it as an experimental system uh, in fall 2021. But we have to see just how, how well it works on an everyday basis. For the National Service and River Prediction System, uh, for the, we're in a big update cycle, as we've mentioned, uh, adding in more satellite data, uh, working on how we uh, project well, the satellite data that we use to produce the analysis of the snowpack uh, from the river point of view. Uh, we'll be adding in the next five years, um, I would think of all of the watersheds along our coastlines. For the water cycle prediction system, at the moment we're the Gulf of St. Lawrence, 
um, and the Great Lakes, I would expect for, for within the next five years that we'll implement a system on Great Slave Lake. Uh, the water cycle prediction system is our system where we represent the full water cycle. It's a closed loop. It's actually very useful for determining uh, component errors. The, um, in the models upstream, if the precipitation is triggered too much in certain physical conditions, then the river routing component will know about it and so on. Uh, the hydrodynamics is prediction system. Uh, we have several domains that the National Hydrological Service has prepared that we're hoping to um, take into our building and deliver to operations. We're also collaborating, well, co-supervising and collaborating with other teams on setting the hydrodynamic model up on Lake Athabasca, the Peace Athabasca Delta, Lake Clare. The idea is that we're targeting uh, priority areas that where this model would be very helpful, where it provide information. Um, so then the references, if for those who would like to know more detail, um, our research scientists, um, then who to talk to for which part and what's already published. So that's what I've prepared. Um, thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks, Dorothy, for that overview. I, I suspect a lot of our, uh, a lot of the provincial uh, and territorial partners will have questions for you over the next few days, Dorothy. So uh, it's a good prompt for them to look at things and maybe prepare themselves for for further dialogue as the as the days roll on here. So that's great. Thanks for doing that. Um, we'll go to our our next um, speaker here. Any questions? Quick questions for Dorothy. We've got about a minute. Okay, I don't see any hands up. So thanks for that, Dorothy. So um, now we'll kind of move into the uh, IJC side of things because we were talking on the trans boundary. So um, I believe Wayne, you're giving the first talk on just the international IJC and collaborative flow forecasting along the US Canada border, UN Adam, I presume. So that's right. Yeah, thanks, Al. So yeah, it's Wayne Jenkins in here with the IJC. Adam Greeley and I will be presenting this jointly today, and I believe Adam's going to kick us off. Are you there, Adam? Yes, I am. Okay. Over thanks, here. Wayne. And thanks, Al. Um, yeah, thanks for giving us the opportunity to chat a bit about uh, the IJC and how we use uh, flow forecasting along the U.S. and the Canadian transboundary region. Um, like Wayne said, I'm Adam Greeley. I'm a science advisor in the IJC's Washington, D.C. office. Um, and of course, in the uh, spirit of binational collaboration, uh, Wayne and I will be tag teaming this presentation. Um, and Wayne's, of course, in the uh, the IJC's Ottawa office. So we'll, um, for those of you that may not be quite as familiar with the IJC, we'll uh, start out with a brief background on the IJC and give a high level overview of how flood forecasts are used at the IJC. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Wayne, who will talk a bit about some of the challenges uh, with transboundary forecasting that uh, that we face, and then we'll we'll tag team a couple of case studies to highlight some specific examples uh, before Wayne wraps up the presentation. So the purpose of the IJC broadly is to help prevent and resolve disputes related to shared waters uh, between the U.S. and Canada. Uh, it's a binational organization providing independent advice to the two governments. Uh, and we focus a lot on evidence-based decision-making, uh, reaching consensus positions, and focusing on the local basin interests uh, along the border. Uh, the last point that we included in here, just as a, you know, kind of an important note, uh, if you're not familiar with us, that uh, you know, we're not a massive organization, as you'll see in the following slides. Uh, we rely a lot on our partnerships with federal and provincial and state agencies as well as local groups and partners to ensure that we have credibility, not only with the scientific and engineering community, uh, but also with public groups that we ultimately serve in their basins. So as I noted, we're a, we're a small basin, we're a binational, uh, sorry, a small binational organization um, that strives for uh, binational parity. Um, and we're headed by six commissioners, three in the United States and three in Canada. 
the IJC itself was established in uh, the 1909 Boundary Waters Treaty, so we've been working in the transboundary uh, region for over 100 years now. Uh, we have three administrative offices. Uh, the two main offices are in Washington, D.C. and Ottawa, with a binational office in Windsor, Ontario, where we have IJC staff from both sides of the border that during uh, non-COVID times uh, get to sit together uh, in the same office uh, and provide us with a, a lot of really great and valuable uh, scientific support. In addition, we uh, collaborate closely with our 19 active boards, committees, and studies along the boundary to monitor and engage in emerging issues and basins where the IJC has a mandate from the governments to address water levels and flows uh, and aquatic ecosystem health, including uh, water quality. So if you want to learn more about uh, the organization uh, as a whole, what we do, where we are, um, we have a lot more details on our website, IJC.org. Uh, with a bunch of uh, great maps and specifics on uh, uh, on each basin if you're interested. So uh, where are we? Um, this is a map uh, showing the transboundary between the United States and Canada with uh, the specific watershed basins that the IJC uh, is involved in highlighted uh, in blue. Um, this is a, a the map contains basins that are uh, currently active as well as those that are not currently active, but uh, over the past 112 years have been part of the IJC's uh, uh, work and mandate on the boundary. We have 19 active boards, studies and committees in the transboundary region with hundreds of members and partners supporting their work. Uh, for instance, the Great Lakes, there are three control boards and one adaptive management committee, which plays a role in helping us support the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Uh, and these groups in the Great Lakes have been active for, for decades and, and will continue so into the future. Uh, in Lake Champlain, Richelieu River Basin, for example, uh, this, is, this area is currently in the middle of a uh, five-year flood study. And when that study ends, our activity in that basin may slow or cease or may continue. It uh, really depends on you know, how we uh, engage with the governments and, and the need for uh, binational collaboration there. Some regions along the boundaries, uh, like the Great Lakes, have a lot more activities than others, but even in uh, some of the smaller basins along the transboundary, they, they each have critically important issues that really require a binational solution, and that's where uh, the IJC really brings a lot of uh, value to the table. So in our talk, uh, you know, we're focused mostly, we're going to focus mainly on um, flow forecasting. Um, and so we've highlighted five of the basins on this map uh, where the IJC specifically employs flow forecasts to binationally manage transboundary waters. So those are the Osoyoos Lake Basin, uh, Kootenai Lake, the Souris River, Rainy Lake of the Woods Basin, and then the Great Lakes. And Wayne and I will focus uh, our case studies on the Great Lakes and the Souris River Basin uh, later in the presentation, so we'll come back to that. One thing to note up front, though, is, uh, you know, the IJC is not a flow forecasting agency itself. So uh, while we use flow forecasts, we don't actually produce the forecasts. The IJC has orders that direct how dams or control structures are to be operated uh, to maintain levels and flows within specific, specific bounds. And we don't actually ourselves operate the control structures directly. It requires flow forecasts um, be developed by the entities responsible for the control structures in order that uh, we ensure that the IJC's orders are properly executed. Um, IJC boards and basins across the boundary um, are the local experts in these regions with the experience and knowledge that help ensure compliance with IJC orders uh, and the operating plan. So we really value our partners and um, collaborators in each of these basins on the transboundary. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it over to Wayne, who will take us into some of the challenges that uh, we face with flow forecasts. We can't hear you, Wayne, so. Sorry, I was waxing eloquently there. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick it up where Adam left off. We, we have, uh, we'll give you some background on some of the challenges we've observed. Uh, implementing forecasting across the transboundary with the help of our agencies and our boards. Um, I'm going to thank David Casson because he said it perfectly. He mentioned that you know modeling is important. We've talked a lot about the modeling today, but he said that modeling and communication are all required. You know, I'll be so bold as to add that you know cooperation is also a key component here because we're looking for the the two countries and their agencies to work together to develop you know forecast solutions. So you know the the four big gaps that we're not gaps but challenges that we're always dealing with our, our data availability and harmonization in the transboundary. 
we often see resource tools and skills gaps across the transboundary. You know, this is where the models would sit. We see binational collaboration and forecasting integration challenges. Um, it's important that these forecasts get compared and integrated. And then finally, for us, it's a huge one for us because we have such strong links to our stakeholders is really engagement with those stakeholders and and the communication um, required to to uh, get that information on the forecasting out. Uh, next slide, Adam, please. Right, so to talk about data availability and harmonization first, this is a you know the upfront challenge that we often face. Um, the problem is is pretty clear. A lot of the data that we require are not harmonized. They're developed by different agencies. They have different standards. Often stop at the border. You know, we saw some examples today where we, we see products that, you know, go as far as the border, and then they're you know, they end jurisdictions end there. So so the products often do as well. That makes us very sad at the IGC. It means that we're not collaborating perhaps as well as we should, and it means that some work has to be done if those products are going to be useful to the commission and and our forecasting work. Um, the collection is not always supportive of, of binational modeling needs, forecasting needs. The picture at the top right is some gamma flights that are done around the, uh, that's sort of the North Dakota, Minnesota, Ontario, Manitoba region. You know, we've got flights happening in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, but for some reason not in Ontario, and they could desperately use some, some you know, snow water equivalent estimates up there during their, during their forecast. So, you know, we see these gaps emerge. Um, Data sharing, data is not always shared. That's less of a problem now. Agencies are pretty good at sharing data. We sometimes see that our, you know, the operators may have some sensitive data they don't want to share with us, or, or sometimes academic data isn't ready to be shared at certain points in time, but that's less of an issue. So we have perennial data problems at the IJC, but the IJC tries to assist in overcoming these. You know, we fund the harmonization of key data sets. We try to promote binational analysis products whenever possible. Um, we support international, key international gauges and leverage tools to to share this data. We also have a sort of a hotline to government, so we will we'll make some noise if it looks like there's some risk to to certain you know gauges in the base and to keep that important these important data sets available across the transboundary. Uh, next Adam please. So this uh, next issue for us or challenge for us is really the resources, tools and you know, knowledge and skill gaps that we see across the transboundary. I mean, it's really where the, the models get developed. Um, you know, we, we often have missing technologies. Maybe models don't exist. Maybe the analysis only exists on one, on one side of the border. Um, we, we have a bit of a, we, can have, we often have a spatial discontinuity there between the, what's, what's available and the different agencies on either side of the border. We also see that, you know, sometimes we have overextended jurisdictions where they can't contribute as much as others. Um, we see that sometimes tools are developed for use in a particular domestic context and, and out of the box, they don't necessarily apply to the other countries. So there's work to be done there. And this is important for our, from our perspective is that often the hydrological expertise, the familiarity with operations, it's so important for us. It's not always available and sometimes it rotates out of the boards. So, you know, different jurisdictions manage resources differently. Resourcing goes up and down for different agencies. People come and go. But importantly, sometimes important knowledge just goes and we need to do our best at the IJC to make sure we don't lose that knowledge. So the IJC needs to keep that, that knowledge, keep the tools together, bridge the skills gaps, find ways to keep that knowledge persistent in the basin. Our permanent boards go a long way to assist us with that. You know, they're, the boards are made up of agency experts in the basin. Often the forecasters are part of that group as well as interested agencies and members of the public. Together, they, they act as a, a repository of skills and, and knowledge to keep, keep us from um, uh, losing a beat on what we're trying to do in vis-a-vis -vis flood forecasting. The IJC also takes an approach to try and build skills in these basins. So we fund studies uh, and projects. These reference studies that come out every now and again are multi-year, multi-million dollar studies. We can really do some heavy lifting during those periods to develop modeling tools, exchange skills, et cetera. We also have smaller studies, we call them IWI studies. They're more five to six figure range and they help boards overcome specific data needs or, or modeling gaps. But we, we try to help where we can to bring that harmonized data understanding together. I heard an interesting thing today, someone said uniqueness of place. I think it might've been Fred. It's really important here. We, we really rely on a bottom up approach from our boards in terms of determining what sort of modeling gets done. We, we wouldn't impose a modeling solution to these groups. We do impose is an approach and we really, lean on open source, sharing of data, transparency is a foundational principle, collaboration whenever possible, and reliability is really important. Track record's important in terms of the tools that get selected. You know, we don't, you know, operational models are different. I think Dave said that as well. And I think we we don't 
we're okay with bleeding edge, but bleeding edge tends to be a bit too much for us, you know, mostly probably because of the blood. But it's something we, we need to make sure these are reliable tools that are being developed in these transboundary regions. We also do a lot of work hosting source code management solutions or cloud computing resources to facilitate the sharing and running of these models. Uh, next slide, please. So the next really is important for us too. It's the binational cooperation and float and forecast integration. So one of the problems that we see often is that agency structures don't generally incentivize binational collaboration or, or oper operationalization. Of course, David Lee said today already that you know they're working well with North with uh, New Brunswick to share data. You know, so there are examples when that, you know independently these groups can see value in collaboration, but that doesn't always happen. And I think you know, maybe it was the few system that allowed for that collaboration to happen. So we we realize that that's a gap, and and we really do have to make sure we bring the agencies together and provide them a reason to to collaborate closely on the work that they do. Um, so often agencies fund, develop, promote science they're familiar with or stuff that they've developed themselves. That's normal. That's how their funding structures work. We have to find ways to leverage that. Um, and then finally, forecasting technologies and applications can, can really be quite different between jurisdictions. It's not always a problem. It can sometimes it can be a good thing. So what we do in the IJCC with our boards is we try to bring the boards together in a, or the agencies together in a way that makes the most sense. Um, sometimes it makes sense for them to each to run their own models and share the results. Um, sometimes the IJC can come in and provide technical support to help bridge those gaps. But the agencies or the, the boards provide a, a forum by which these, these uh, challenges in, in cooperation can be overcome. Next, please. And finally, for us, is the stakeholder engagement communication. So this is a big one for us. Um, for many boundary waters, the stakeholders look to the IJC for guidance, you know, for what's happening in the basin, including water level forecasts. You'll remember Adam said we're not a forecasting agency, so that's can be problematic in and of itself. So each agency may have a different forecasting mandate or maybe no mandate. So communication protocols, emergency response, citizen outreach can be different for the different agencies. Having multiple competing forecasts in one water body can really confuse the public and it can be really problematic. So we try to erode, we try to avoid that because it erodes trust. And then forecast, we know this too, that forecasting concepts can be you know, famously difficult to communicate effectively. Probabilities are very hard for the layperson to understand. So we have to come up with ways to to improve that. So you know, the boards, board structures allow for consolidation of these forecasting tools and data, coordinating of coordination of messaging. We have advisory groups that we usually we often attach to our boards that helps us understand how to get the messaging out properly and to support better ties to the public and indigenous groups, for instance. Um, we have IGC communication staff that can help produce good product that people can understand. And um, we hold meetings in the basin all the time with our boards to make sure that people have an opportunity to directly interact with our boards to understand what the issues are. So um, yeah, so that gives you an idea of how we're trying to uh, you know, deal with these challenges, um, the IGC approach, if you like. And I think now Adam's going to go through one example, and I'll follow up with another quickly before we close the presentation. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Yeah, the first case today we'll kind of touch on is the Great Lakes, um, and I won't talk about all of them because we'd be here all afternoon, so I'll just focus on uh, Lake Ontario. And this is a basin that's the IJC board, um, the Lake Ontario Great Lake, uh, St. Lawrence River Watershed Board, or not Watershed Board, Control Board, my apologies. Um, uh, the territory that this board covers is quite extensive, um, covering all of Lake Ontario and the Lake uh, St. Lawrence River down to trois Rivières. Uh, in addition, the Ottawa River confluence with the St. Lawrence River at Montreal creates a really dynamic system um, where, uh, particularly during spring freshet, and when the Ottawa River inflows to the St. Lawrence River, it requires the IGC operating plan to adjust outflows from Lake Ontario. So the IGC has a mandate to regulate outflows from Lake Ontario via the Moses Saunders Dam um, and has been doing so since the dam began operations in 1958. Uh, the operating plan has changed a couple of times since the dam was uh, first became operational. Uh, the most recent plan that we're that we're operating under is called Plan 2014 and was implemented in 2017. It took more than 16 years of scientific investigations and negotiations through some of these uh, technical working committees that uh, Maine, uh, Wayne was referencing earlier. Uh, and this is due in part that the long time and, and study going into this in part was due to the complicated balances that the plan tries to achieve between upstream and downstream interests through outflow limits 
uh, to address uh, Lake Ontario water levels, uh, St. Lawrence River water levels, both upstream and downstream of Moses Saunders Dam, flooding, low water concerns, shipping and navigation interests, as well as lake and riverine eco uh, ecological concerns. And many of these limits can be play in at play at, uh, uh, at the same time. So this graphic is just kind of highlighting the complexity of the, the situation that we uh, that we often face. And this is showing Lake Ontario outflows over the course of one year where the black line is the, the outflows from Lake Ontario. Uh, and the different limits uh, that affect outflow at a given time are, are different colored shaded regions on this. So in this particular example, the outflows are trying to balance considerations for commercial navigation in yellow. Lower flows needed to establish a stable ice cover in winter uh, to help protect municipal and water infrastructure in blue, and low flows needed to prevent downstream flooding during the Ottawa River freshet in green there. And to help prepare for changing hydrologic conditions, the IJC relies on a coordinated forecast provided by Environment Climate Change Canada, which is the, the figure you see on the top right there. Uh, which is the same as the the bottom right figure uh, provided by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and and you know this is the uh, where that binational uh, collaboration really meets the road here um, with with this coordinated forecast. Uh, the IJC regulation representatives affiliated with Environment Climate Change Canada and Army Corps of Engineers provide a six month outlook for IJC boards based on the coordinated forecasts once a month. Uh, and this forecast incorporates deterministic forecasts in the first few weeks of the outlook, uh, but then it kind of switches to the historical flows to provide a, a measure of uncertainty in lake levels over the later months. And so this highlights one of the big challenges that we face, and that's the capacity of the control systems to affect change uh, to Lake Ontario levels. Uh, it's it's slow at times. It can be like trying to change the water level in a bathtub with a straw. So. Uh, operational decisions to change lake outflows often take months to be realized and then are very much dependent on the prevailing hydrologic conditions at the time. So this really highlights the important role of coordinated forecasts uh, for the IJC and the need to identify information that can help inform decisions on the seasonal timescales, as well as Wayne uh, mentioned earlier, you know, the need for good collaboration and good communication of that, that data and that forecasts between the IJC and its local partners. Uh, so I'll hand it back to Wayne real quick to talk about uh, the second case study. Thanks, Adam. I realize we don't have a lot of time, but I'll, I'll go through this quickly. So, you know, the Soros River is a, an important river for us too. We have a long history there. Um, and our role there really is, is, is linked to an agreement between the US and Canada called the 1989 Agreement for Dam Operations, you know, really that dictates how three dams that are, are in Saskatchewan and one in North Dakota are used to manage, you know, floods, water supply, et cetera, in, in the basin. So the IGC has a role in making sure that that agreement is, is, is followed. Next slide, please. So one of the roles that the, we have for our board is, is you know, forecasting. You know, they, they are responsible for deciding if it's a flood year or not based on the one in 10 flood frequency. So they get together periodically combine their flood forecasting efforts, Saskatchewan and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers through, you know, the NWS. They, they combine their, their, their different forecasts. They are quite different, um, regression versus deterministic or probabilistic, and they come up with a combined that, that is presented to the board and the board makes that decision. So it's an example of two very different approaches to forecasting brought together by the board with discussion to to figure out how uh, how operations are going to proceed for the following year. Uh, next slide, please. Interestingly, in this basin too, we've we've been given a, a study um, recently uh, following the 20, uh, 2011 flooding, massive floods. I mean, you, you may many of you will be aware of it, but if you aren't, you can look it up. Um, those are pictures of Minot uh, during twenty eleven. Following that flood, um, the government gave, gave us a reference to investigate. Um, operations in that basin more thoroughly. So we've had a, we're in the process of a four year study to evaluate the performance of the operating plan, but also looking at how well the forecasting has performed. And in the process of this study, we've developed a number of hydrological tools that are going to be useful to the board going forward. So we've given them a, our permanent board a really a leg up now um, for future, future forecasting, you know, in part because of the work that's been done by, by this by this study board. Um, they should be finished their work probably uh, mid-year this year, I think. 
And last slide, please, Kat, or, uh, Adam. So just some closing messages. Um, so often we try to think of like one big modeling system that operates across the transboundary. That maybe doesn't always work. We think multiple systems are okay and it has worked for us uh, in the past. Maybe it's preferred. Um, provide some sort of model comparison, but close persistent collaboration is required for this to be successful. And that's where our boards come in. And, and if our boards aren't there, hopefully some other structures in place to allow for that co coordination to happen. Um, funded supported by national organizations like the IJC or the Great Lakes Coordinating Committee or others are probably necessary to set common objectives and bridge some of these technical and data gaps. Um, we think that you need to leverage and support domestic agency mandates and initiatives as much as possible. That's where a lot of the good work happens. Um, you don't need to reinvent any wheels, but if you can leverage that work, um, you can really go quite some distance and, you know, and support those agencies too. And then finally, the IJC way is just bringing people together often to collaborate, share science and technology, and really to build trust so that uh, we can work together and, and uh, do so successfully. Last slide, I guess, just our acknowledgements, and then maybe we'll hand it over for questions. And sorry to be a bit late. Great. Thanks, both, both you guys, um, Adam and Wayne. Uh, quick question and for either of these folks. Okay, I don't see any hands up. So, yeah, I think I think this is a uh, great um, food for thought for both uh, ECC and uh, and NOAA as part of the uh, the MOU agreement to think about how they could better help the IJC down the road here. So, so uh, yeah, thanks to both of you for presenting. That's that's wonderful. We'll go on to our our last uh, discussion of the the day. Save the the best for last. Um, so we've got uh, Debbie Lee and Ken Howard from NOAA um, talking about transboundary data and integration of Canadian data into the MRMS system. So it looks like uh, it looks like Ken, you're going to start. Is that correct? Or Debbie, or it should um, be. I'm going to go ahead and start, uh, Al. And I believe uh, Jim Knoll was going to present and run the slides today. So, Jim, are you on and ready? Oh, there's Jim. Yeah, sorry. Can you see, can you see my slides? Confused. Okay, great, great. Well, I want to uh, first thank you, Al, for inviting us. And um, this has been a great forum today. I think everybody's learning a great deal. Um, and second, um, I'd also like to thank everybody else for staying to the end of the day. I know it's always hard to. Uh, make it to that last presentation, so thank you. I'd like to say that uh, Wayne and uh, Adam's talk were really important to uh, Ken, Jen's, mine, and Vincent's uh, presentation because it talked about harmonization and the challenges of harmonizing data across the transboundary. Uh, more than 70 years ago, uh, it was recognized that there was a need for harmonization of hydrologic data sets across the boundary, uh, particularly for management of the Great Lakes. And in 1953, a binational and multi-agency ad hoc committee was formed. It has a really long name called the Coordinating Committee on Great Lakes Basic Hydraulic and Hydrologic Data. So it was formed for that very purpose, to be able to develop data needed to manage the Great Lakes binationally. And uh, that committee has continued today very successfully, and it continues to coordinate datums, water levels, connecting channel flows, and components of the water supply. And uh, what we're Sorry going to, to talk interrupt. about- Sorry to interrupt. We yeah. can't see your slides right now. Oh, really? Yes, I'm just giving an introduction, but Jim will put the slides up, I think. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and as technology has changed, we've been able to get more advanced information, uh, better information. However, sometimes the technology itself um, has uh, not actually solved all the problems because institutional challenges or barriers have come along with it as we've developed our own models, our own uh, ways of developing products or communicating, or even maybe policies uh, of each country with regard to data. So uh, Jim's gonna talk to us today about the challenges we've faced in developing a new 
coordinated binational precipitation data set uh, for the Great Lakes. Yeah, Debbie, for some reason, my computer is not letting me letting me share. Is there a way that you could run the slides? Um, that's a possibility. It's it's the power of technology. Okay. My app is blocking it. Why? Have to give me one second here. Thank you. <clears throat> and if, if that doesn't work, uh, Jim, we can. Uh, I know we've got a copy too, so we can get to Evan to to put it up if, if it doesn't work for Debbie either. Okay. Thank you. Hold on one moment, and I think I can do this. I can find the correct window. And we are on our way. Perfect. Thanks, Debbie. All right, thank you. So maybe, Debbie, if you put it in presentation mode yet, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Can you all see that and can you hear Jim? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Jim, go ahead and take it away. All right, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so the goal of what we've been working on, um, I sit on the International Coordinating Committee for the Great Lakes for uh, Basic Hydrology and Hydraulics. And one of the things that um, we decided to start on uh, quite a few years ago, around 2015, was the ability to um, look at the best coordinated hydrologic science data sets we have available for the Great Lakes along that transboundary. Um, and a good place to start was precipitation because we have a, a pretty good reservoir of information there. Um, so if you move on to the next slide, um, to get there, <clears throat> we needed to kind of look at where we currently are uh, for the Great Lakes. And what has been going on for many decades is we've been using a legacy gauge only precipitation method uh, for both land and over lake in the Great Lakes. Um, that the problem with that is it's a coordinated da precipitation data set on a monthly and annual time scale. But to get that uh, approved uh, coordinated data set, it usually takes one to two years to get finalized between um, the US and Canada, and it's not real time. Um, at the same time, um, there's been a lot of advances in science that we wanted to look at. Um, on the US side, the National Ocean Service part of NOAA is the really the gatekeeper because of the over lake area for that precipitation data set, along, in, along with co <laughs> close coordination with the Army Corps of Engineers and other uh, parties on the US side. And then on the Canadian side, it's the Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, if we move on to the next slide. So as you can probably imagine is when you're using gauge only over big lakes like Lake Superior, um, using a, the old Thiessen weighted method um, doesn't really help for really knowing what's going on over those um, Great Lakes areas. And that uh, leads to big issues with uh, water budgets. And so <clears throat> Vincent, which was talking earlier today, and myself and some, several others began to discuss the idea of using the latest science on both sides of the country to begin to look at potential ways to replace that coordinated data set. Um, on the Canadian side, it's CAPA, the Canadian Precipitation Analysis. And on the US side, there's really two uh, precipitation data sets. Um, one comes out of the river forecast centers, and that's the multi-sensor precipitation estimates from the 13 river forecast centers. And then there's also the uh, latest science of the multi-radar, multi-sensor MRMS that I'll be talking a little bit more about. And really, the MRMS is now the basis really for the MPE. The only difference is on the U.S. side, the MPE data is quality controlled by some humans as well in that quality control, quality assurance process. Um, so what we wanted to move towards is, is there a way we can merge um, both the Kappa and MPE data? And that began, that process began in 2015, and that is currently um, in use and in practice. 
But we also have the ability to potentially look at emerging Kappa and MRMS. So if we move on to the next slide, I'm going to take a look a little bit more detail of the different precipitation data sets that each country has. Um, I'm not going to go spend too much time on this. Um, Vincent was talking about the Kappa uh, precipitation. Um, what we're using in the merged data set is the 10 kilometer um, for the Kappa. Um, we consider this the best real-time product for precipitation. Um, again, as I noted earlier, the coordinated data set for precipitation in the Great Lakes and along the transboundary is the coordinated data set um, is not in real time. So one of the really important things is that we wanted to look at real time precipitation. Um, if we move on to the next slide then, and we'll shift our gear a little bit towards the MPE data from um, the US side and talk about, or actually MRMS first. So MRMS serves as the basis for MPE. Um, it is an automated objective analysis uh, similar to CAPA. Um, it's developed by the NOAA National Severe Storms Laboratory um, in Norman, Oklahoma, and is operationalized through the uh, NOAA's National Center for Environmental Prediction. And again, just like uh, CAPA, it is the best uh, real-time precipitation science that we have. Um, if we move on to the next slide then. <clears throat> So in our multi-sensor precipitation analysis within the National Weather Service of NOAA at the River Forecast Centers, we take that MRMS data and we do additional um, quality control uh, by the River Forecast Centers, and that data has been around since 1996. And then if we move on to the next slide, we now uh, have the ability to merge this binational precipitation product. And I think this is really important. This is a good foundation of showing how we have two countries, we have a transboundary, and we're able to merge the products uh, of the best precipitation signs. And where this is important is that this could lead to additional merging, like both countries, Canada and the US, have uh, snow water equivalents, for example. So this, uh, this project. Um, is definitely opening doors to how we can uh, work together to improve um, the inputs to our hydrologic um, products and services and modeling. So this uh, binational precipitation product is um, hosted at the NOAA's uh, Midwest Regional Climate Center, which is part of the University of Illinois. Um, the data is merged where what we do with this product is um, over the U.S. we use the U.S. MPE data and over Canada we use CAPA. But then over the actual Great Lakes themselves, we merge the two products and average them right now. Um, we could always change the, the technique that we use to, to do the merging. Um, but the bottom line here is we have a, a tool that kind of gives us a consensus of what is the best water that is getting into the watershed for the Great Lakes. Um, we are upscaling the US MPE data from four kilometer to 10 kilometer. Um, just so we have a consensus between Kappa and uh, MPE data. So we are generating this at 10 kilometer resolution. Uh, we output graphics, gridded data, um, CSV files, all different formats. If you go on to the next slide, <clears throat> not only do we um, do this um, for real time um, in the last um, 24 hours to 90 days, um, we also have the ability to archive and utilize the data back in time. So all these products, the, the Kappa data, the MPE, and the merge data are available. Um, and this is all in real time. Every day it's updated. And that's a big thing. Um, so when Environment Canada and Climate Change Canada and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers wants to look at how the precipitation for like the month of February is going, we don't have to wait for the legacy method to look at how precipitation totals are occurring over the Great Lakes themselves. So that's a huge plus. In addition, when we did this product, um, <clears throat> we worked with the IJC through the um, Institute, Institute for Water Resources to get funding to create anomalies. So not only do we actually have the actual total values, but we have the anomalies for the MPE, the Kappa, and the merged product available. If you move on to the next slide, the archive data is available um, since 2002. 
Um, and again, CAPA was operationalized uh, in 2011, but we have the data for both uh, MPE and CAPA as well as the merged product back to 2002 in all different formats. Um, you can get it over the Great Lakes, uh, but working with the uh, International Coordinating Committee, working with the partner agencies and the IJC and some of the ideas, um, this is available along all of the U.S. Canadian border, not just in the Great Lakes. So we went a step further to demonstrate the ability to do this. But this uh, archive data can be uh, retrieved from um, real time all the way back to 2002 currently. If you move on to the next slide. <clears throat> So let's go back to the, as we kind of bring this all back together, let's go back to the Great Lakes goal then. We want to look at ways to replace the legacy gauge only method with the best science from each country. Um, to do that, we've created this coordinated uh, near real time data set for precipitation for the Great Lakes. And again, along the entire US Canadian border. Um, during a uh, North American flood workshop in September, even uh, Mexico was very interested in this data. Um, this product is hosted at the uh, NOAA Midwest Regional Climate Center. So the one thing that's lacking in um, all of this is the operationalizing of it. Um, it was mentioned earlier how kind of in the US we have MRMS as the operational data set as well as MPE. On the Canadian side we have CAPA um, and then we have this merged product. Um, the only difference is CAPA and MRMS uh, and MP are all operationalized where they have like 20 set, 24 by 7 support. Um, the merged product does not. Um, there occasionally has been some outages since this went into service in 2015. And so that is one of the questions that has uh, arisen. Um, if you go to the next slide, Debbie. <clears throat> So one of the questions is that we want to look at um, is the, the ability to can we replace the MPE with MRMS uh, on the US side? So what we've done is we're working with Ken Howard at the National Severe Storms Laboratory uh, where they where they actually work on MRMS and develop it uh, to do a verification process for not only MRMS, including the Canadians 10 centimeter new radars, um, but also MPE and Kappa. And we are verifying that against uh, the Coco Ross or the community rain, hail and snow network to see if on at least on the large scale, maybe not on the extremely small watersheds, but on a larger scale is the automated MRMS again, very similar to Kappa. Um, really good enough for the size of the Great Lakes that we could potentially just use MRMS instead of the MPE um, within that system or again potentially continue potentially you know keep both um, going uh, both the MPE and CAP Emerge as well as MRMS CAP Emerge we don't know but this project uh, verification runs through um, about October of this year and then we're going to take a look at it. But the one real, real question that we do have is um, we have a great product uh, here uh, showing how we can merge U.S. Canadian precipitation um, to potentially replace coordinated uh, legacy gauge only that has a lot of bugs with it. A lot of bad data is in there, a lot of additional stuff that has to go through to try to improve water balance information for hydrology. Um, but the one question that, that will remain is that we do have to address is um, how important is it to operationalize any kind of merged product like MRMS and Kappa? So we'll know more as the year goes along in terms of if MRMS is good enough to replace MPE. But regardless of that, whether it's MRMS or MPE on the US side, the question is, is, is the uh, hosting of this at the NOAA's Midwest Regional Climate Center good enough for operations in the Great Lakes or does it need to be operationalized and where would that be hosted if not at NOAA or ECCC where would we do that? So that's kind of uh, what we wanted to introduce today and um, I'll, Debbie or myself could uh, definitely take any questions. Great thanks both Jim and, and Debbie for that that's that's great and nice nice place to leave off actually because it's Always interesting how do you bring these things together, right? And and uh, 
instructive for some of this, the students and postdocs on these calls, right, to know that uh, um, a lot of decisions made in, in governments and across the transboundary are actually not always technical. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion that goes on for a lot of other reasons too, right? So um, it's important to understand that uh, there's lots of reasons I'm making decisions and cooperation is a lot of work for everybody. So anyways, any questions for, for either Debbie or um, Jim? OK, well, Robert Phillips, maybe? Yeah, Robert Phillips has a no, Sorry, yeah, sorry, I missed that. Whoever it is can please speak up. I can't always tell. Oh, Robert, you're on mute. Still can't hear you. Al, it looks like also Matthew uh, Noteboom also may have a question from ECC. Okay, thanks. Could somebody, can somebody in the control room take uh, Robert off of mute? It looks like Robert has to unmute himself. Uh, so he's I think I see the question there. He says, how do you verify data from Kokoros? Okay. Um, well, one of the things is um, there's two ways to do it. Um, we're still discussing that. Uh, Vincent Fortan at uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada talks about how CAPA has a, like an independent data set from Kokoros on the uh, 6Z or 6UTC run that we could look at. Um, but one of the things is that uh, we're trying to get as independent as possible. Um, we're still working out the details of how we will do this and whether we'll do it just with Kokoros to try to look at something independent from um, the, some of the precipitation networks in real time on the one hourly kind of time scale or three hourly. Uh, but again, one of the other things is we could look at the Kappa as well on the 6Z UTC run, which is independent of Kokoros. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about the technical glitch there. Okay, any any further questions? Matt, did you have a question or you just wanted to respond as an organizer? There was no question. He says it's just a misclick. Yeah, okay. All good. Okay, well, I think that brings us, unless I'm missing something, to the end of the day. Is that right, Evan? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so I'd like to thank everybody for the patience. I know this is would have been much more fun in person somewhere nice, like, I don't know, Tuscaloosa or something, but um, whatever, maybe next time. Um, but uh, yeah, so so stay tuned. Tomorrow um, we start again. Uh, Evan, can you remind me of the time? I don't have the agenda quite open here, but... Not a problem. We start at, again at uh, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. Great. So hopefully this this format was good for everybody and we still have 137 people hanging on. So that's or a little bit more. So that's great. Um, and yeah, look forward to seeing most of you tomorrow and uh, have a good night and uh, look forward to some more interesting discussions tomorrow. And thanks to all the presenters for for, uh, for all their hard work and the, and the great presentations. It really was wonderful. So OK, we'll sign off. Take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.